Marrying Her Best Friend Book 3 in The Seymour Siblings by Fiona Myers Narrated by Catherine Bilson Chapter 1 Despite the elegant ambiance in the large ballroom, an unsettled feeling remained rooted inside the pit of Elizabeth Seymour's stomach. She didn't care what people thought of her, or her brothers, the Duke of Somerset, heroic and somewhat violent attempt to ensure that her reputation was left intact. But Lizzie still heard the whispers and felt the reluctance of the people around her to have any kind of interaction with her as they glanced her way with side-eyed looks. Beyond the judgmental expressions, they were cautious to avoid conversation with her, which made little sense given the regular and not-so-secret activities of half the ton. Were they perhaps under the impression that alleged promiscuity was contagious? Or perhaps the shame of being in the company of such a light-skirted woman threatened their reputations? Whatever the reason for her isolation, Lizzie lifted her chin and pointedly ignored their ambiguous stares and forced smiles. Instead, she proceeded along the length of the decadently decorated ballroom belonging to the Marquess and Marchioness of Wheeling. She had already decided she was no longer interested in trivial and mindless chatter from people who didn't make time to know her. She didn't appreciate anyone who was not sincere at this moment in time when she needed sincerity the most. Thanks to what she had endured, she would, indeed, value a sincere strength of spirit above many other virtues for the rest of her days. Today she had received a letter from her older brother, Will. He and Emma had married suddenly while on a ship heading toward the port of Elsinore in Denmark. The romance between Will and Emma had been unbelievable at first. When they had met, they could not tolerate even being in the same room together. Somehow the stars aligned and love prevailed when Will made a grand gesture by boarding the train Emma was on at the very last minute and joining her on her journey to Edinburgh. Lizzie was glad for her brother. Emma was strong enough to keep Will on a straight path, and they were, indeed, a perfectly matched couple. Admittedly, Woodlock Manor had been quiet since her boisterous brother had departed, and while her oldest brother James and his wife Kitty prepared for the birth of their child, Lizzie had little to do but quietly wander about the estate. She had assisted Kitty with trips to town and selecting furniture for the nursery, and as much as Lizzie appreciated that the Duchess had included her in these tasks, she could not help but feel as though she was intruding. Of course, Kitty had assured her many times that this was not the case, but she still was not convinced. James's wife was most likely just being her usual polite and sweet self. Lizzie would most certainly not admit it to anyone out loud, but she was lonely without Will and Emma to distract her, and as she was the last of her siblings still unmarried, she felt as though she would have been a disappointment to her parents if they were still alive. Despite being the youngest Seymour sibling, she had always been convinced she would be the first to embrace matrimonial bliss. Never in her wildest dreams had she imagined her tight-lipped eldest brother, the Duke, and her rake of a brother, Will, would marry before she did. And both were genuine love matches at that. She was thrilled for them both that they had found such happiness, but there was a pang in her own heart, and a kernel of fear that maybe the same happy ending would not be available to her. My lady, a familiar male voice suddenly called out nearby removing her from the sombre cloud of self-contemplation she had somehow fluttered her way inside. Lizzie turned to her right, and a smile formed on her lips at the sight of her dear friend, Mr. Carson Wallace. He stood there, appearing very dashing in his formal wear. She'd known Carson for a very long while, as his family resided in the estate neighbouring Woodlock Manor. They had spent many summer days in the estate gardens playing as children. Despite Carson's father not bearing a title, the Wallace family was noble in their own right. 
a very influential and important family whose wealth spanned as far as their influence. Carson's mother had separated from his father under rather scandalous circumstances and forsaken Somerset without her son, which left the young Master Wallace feeling rather abandoned. Luckily, he'd seemed to find solace in Lizzie's company, and he would often sneak through a hole in the wall separating the two estates, concealed by thick vines of ivy and foliage. Lizzie loved those secret visits as much as the formal visits facilitated by their parents, and she kept an eye out whenever she thought Carson might sneak over to play. His father didn't seem to care that he spent so much time with Lizzie, and he would often visit to have tea with her parents while the two of them played in the garden. Carson had been a good friend to Lizzie for many years, but as soon as he reached the age of thirteen, he'd befriended her brother Will, suddenly seeming to prefer his male company instead of hers. Lizzie hadn't seen him as much after that, and if she tried to join in with them, Will would shoo her away, grumbling about annoying little sisters trying to tag along and ruin things. Carson! Lizzie greeted him now with genuine cheer, delighted to have someone to speak with who didn't force his smiles and scurry away without meeting her eyes the moment she spoke. How lovely it is to see you! And you, my lady. Carson reciprocated her cheerful greeting before softly kissing her hand. You're dressed very formally this evening. We are in the presence of nobility. Lizzie grinned. Carson chuckled, and his light green gaze met with hers. So clear, so direct, so unafraid of being tainted by her bad reputation. Her heart lightened as he asked, Would you care to dance? You are well aware that once we start, I will not be able to stop. Your dancing is enchanting and difficult to cut short, Lizzie admitted. And one can only dance so much. You think dancing has a limit? Who told you such a ridiculous thing? Carson's eyes sparkled with amusement. Apparently everything has a limit before it becomes unnecessary and trivial, Lizzie answered, more bitterly than she intended to. She took a deep breath, trying to release some of her frustration about her current situation and forced a smile to her lips. She didn't want to place a dampener on her conversation with Carson. He was not the cause of her annoyance, nor did she wish to involve him in her woes. Carson gazed even more intently at her and cocked his head. Is everything all right, Lizzie? Everything is fine, Carson. How are you? Have you been doing anything interesting? She was desperate to shift the topic of conversation. If listening to carpenters hammering in the manor house is considered interesting, then indeed I have, Carson answered with a chuckle. That is right. You are having the library redone after the rains of the winter caused some damage. I had forgotten about that, Lizzie answered. How is everything progressing? Too slow for my liking. But you have always been such a patient man. Lizzie placed her hand on his. Carson lowered his gaze for a few seconds, then glanced back at Lizzie, his eyes suddenly changing. She wasn't certain what happened in that moment, but her heart began to pound in her chest as Carson's light green gaze consumed her. Her skin tingled under his touch, and she quickly removed her hand from his, her unsettled feeling now stemming from a completely different cause. Thank you for the offer to dance, Carson. Lizzie managed to say as she caught her breath. Perhaps in a while. I must first visit the powder room. Very well. But I will seek you out if a while becomes too long, Carson answered, with a charming smile and a hint of wry amusement in his tone. Lizzie cocked her head and glanced at him before she turned away. What had just happened between them? She made her way through the ballroom, once again passing the curious gazes of the other guests, but this time her thoughts were focused more on that strange moment with Carson than any snide looks or whispers. Though it wasn't possible to ignore them completely, 
she did manage to keep the ominous feeling that tried to claw its way to the surface contained deep inside. Instead of allowing public opinion to negatively affect her, she held her head high and proceeded to the powder room. There was no one inside, much to her relief. She stared at herself in the mirror that was perched on a low mantel. Tears threatened to make their appearance, and she pressed her lips firmly together and glared at her reflection to stop them welling up. Her brow furrowed when she considered the strange feeling she'd experienced when she touched Carson's hand. She had been hiding her adoration for Carson for most of her life, and it had become such a habit that the sudden surge of emotions was unexpected and rather strange. She couldn't allow herself to love him any more than she already did, as he had never shown any sign that he reciprocated her feelings as anything other than an old and dear friend. And the last thing Lizzie wanted was to lose the only person who truly believed she was still good inside, and not the monster everyone else in Somerset thought she was. Monster may have been a strongly worded term, but their stares and whispers made her feel as such. An abomination to her gender. A loose woman. She drew in a slow breath, gathering her strength to push through the remainder of the evening. She couldn't wait until this ordeal was over, and she could be safely ensconced in the confines of her bedchambers, where no judgment was passed, and she was able to breathe freely once again. Lizzie lightly touched her hair and brushed a loose tendril from her cheek. While she gathered her courage to face the guests in the ballroom once more, she smoothed the skirt of her dress and drew in one last breath before leaving the powder room. The guests in the ballroom had carried on as though she had never left, or perhaps as though she didn't exist. She sauntered toward the refreshment table, pretending indifference. As she passed a group of women, she heard their words, which cut deeply, like swords through her flesh. I saw her earlier with Carson, practically undressing the poor man with her eyes. Such a promiscuous woman! The only reason Lord Dorset publicly admitted the tales were untrue was because His Grace paid him to do so. Perhaps we should ask her. Lizzie! Lady Margaret's pitchy voice called out to her, and despite every cell in her body begging her not to respond, she slowly turned around. Lady Margaret and her group of young women were simpering directly at her. All had matching fake smiles and a nasty light in their eyes. Yes, Lady Margaret, Lizzie inquired, forcing a smile. Do you have a moment to spare? There is something we must ask you. Margaret answered, with no regard for correct forms of address. Margaret was the daughter of a duke, as was Lizzie, but Lady Margaret considered herself a much higher rank and class. She was a spoiled young woman who only used people as she saw fit in order to obtain what she wished and threw her father's fortune in everyone's faces. And what might that be? Lizzie inquired, already knowing what was coming. How much did your brother pay Lord Dorset to inform everyone that the tales he told of you were untrue? Margaret asked, and her group of cronies giggled behind her with their pseudo-shocked expressions. Lizzie's eyes narrowed, but she would not allow these women to upset her. Perhaps you should stop pretending that you are such a saint, Lady Margaret. We all know what activities you and Lord Nile partake in down at the stables. Lizzie sighed, annoyed at herself for stooping so low as to match Lady Margaret's nastiness. Lady Margaret raised a brow and crossed her arms. And this comes from a woman who spends more time on her back than anyone else in Somerset? As opposed to bent over a hay bale, Lizzie countered. Lady Margaret expelled a gasp and shook her head. Is Carson aware of your dalliances? Surely. He would not want you if he were to find out about you and Lord Quinton. His mother. Do not dare speak of things of which you have no knowledge, Lizzie exploded. Every single tale Lord Dorset has spread of me is false. I am not a promiscuous woman, but I do not require anyone to believe me. 
I don't give a fig what anyone thinks of me, least of all you. You know nothing of life, and I pity you more than anything. As Margaret's eyes widened in shock, Lizzie whirled around and moved to the refreshment table. She grabbed a bottle of wine, not caring in the least how unladylike she appeared, and stomped out of the ballroom toward the terrace. She rushed down the narrow steps and disappeared into the night, still clutching the wine. Chapter Two Carson made his way through the ballroom, leaving the whispers of the gossips behind. He had witnessed the verbal confrontation between Lizzie and Lady Margaret, along with her group of ignorant and judgmental ladies. In his opinion, that term was not even accurate. They were anything but ladies. They were cruel and unkind. He had not imagined, however, that Lizzie would ever speak such harsh truths to Lady Margaret, or anyone else for that matter. She was clearly fed up with Lady Margaret, and perhaps everything that she had been going through had finally caught up with her. He had known of the situation that involved Lizzie and Lord Dorset, but after a lengthy discussion with Will, he knew there was no truth to the rumours being spread, much to his great relief. He could not bear the thought of Lizzie being with another man, especially not one with such a devious reputation as Lord Dorset. He'd had feelings for Lizzie since he was a boy, but he had never said anything to her, as he was certain he would never measure up. She was the daughter of a duke, and despite his own family's reputation and status, he was convinced that she was much too good for him. She deserved to be courted by a man with a title, not someone like him. A nobody. It had pained him through the years as he watched her be courted by young gentlemen, but he had managed to remain silent. He'd kept his feelings to himself, and all this time he had been convinced it was better this way. But he had spent many of his nights thinking of Lizzie and imagining what his life would have been like had he possessed the courage to make his feelings known and the ability to offer her the position and title in life that she truly deserved. There had been times when he had almost spoken up. Times when he imagined declaring how he felt and discovering that title and position did not matter. However, the thought of her rejecting him was one of his worst fears. And truly, she did deserve the best. Despite his general confidence in life, it was becoming increasingly more difficult to think about the woman whom he'd loved for most of his existence living a happy life without him. The cool night air brushed against his face as he stepped onto the terrace and caught sight of Lizzie, who steadily stomped toward the stable block, clutching the bottle of wine she had pilfered from the refreshment table. He had never seen her act as erratically as she had tonight, but he didn't blame her in the least. He was uncertain of exactly what Lady Margaret had said to her, but it had to have been rather upsetting for her to retaliate in such an impulsive manner. Carson descended the narrow set of stairs that led to the side of the manor house, and in the distance watched Lizzie disappear into the stable building, which also held the hayloft. She left the door to the building ajar, allowing him access a few moments later. The space was dark, but numerous beams of bright moonlight shone through the openings of the loft above his head, illuminating the inside of the stables in a silver light. Carson stepped inside and immediately noticed Lizzie seated on a bale of hay. The expression on her beautiful face was sad as she glanced down at the open bottle of wine. Her shoulders were slumped and there was an air of defeat about her that he could not reconcile with the Lizzie he knew. As he took a step closer, the door banged behind him. He froze as Lizzie jumped before glancing up at him. Carson held his hands up apologetically. My apologies, my lady. No need to apologize. Lizzie sighed. And it's Lizzie, not my lady. You know that. What are you doing here, Carson? It appears formalities have left us. Carson grinned. It is only for appearances, Lizzie said. We passed formalities many years ago, did we not? I believe we left them behind as soon as you threw me in the pond, Carson pointed out. 
Well, what did you expect? You threw an innocent frog at me, Lizzie defended, sitting up straighter and looking less dejected. Perhaps your actions were justified then, Carson chuckled. May I join you? You went to all the trouble to follow me here, so you may as well take a seat. Lizzie shrugged and lifted the bottle to take a very unladylike swig of the wine. Carson approached the bale of hay, and as he sat down beside Lizzie, she passed the bottle to him. He took it from her and sipped from the opening, then cringed at the bitter taste of the beverage. Couldn't you have chosen a better-tasting wine? You ought to be grateful I am sharing it with you at all, Lizzie countered, and playfully slapped him on the arm as she took back her bottle. Why did you follow me? I noticed your encounter with Lady Margaret, and I wanted to see if you were all right, Carson answered. I am perfectly well. Margaret is a silly and foolish woman who doesn't know anything about anything, Lizzie answered. I am well. Carson nodded and glanced around him, not believing her for one moment. Which is why you retreated to the stables in a cloud of dust with an entire bottle of wine. You must be very well indeed. It was rather theatrical of me, was it not? Lizzie cringed. Carson smiled encouragingly at her, wanting more information. But I'm all right, Carson, really. I don't understand why people relish the idea of spreading rumours about someone, especially when they are false. It is uncouth and hurtful, and honestly, there are enough sordid truths around the ton that people don't need to resort to untruths to get their nasty enjoyment, Lizzie answered. He didn't have a good answer for that. She was correct. He could think of a dozen people of their mutual acquaintance, right off the top of his head, who would not like their dirty secrets aired in public. Margaret is a foolish woman, as you said. Lizzie sighed and shook her head. It is not only her. Lord Dorset was the one who started it all, spreading lies about the two of us. Who in their sober minds would do such a terrible thing? And why? Carson watched as Lizzie drank from the wine bottle for a few moments, then took it from her. Men such as Dorset need to tell tales to make them feel better about themselves. He feels the need to belittle and degrade others to make himself seem superior. It is ego, which is a dangerous problem to have because it can ruin lives, as you are already aware, my lady. You must always remember, when it comes to people like Dorset, you are not the problem, Lizzie. He is. Lizzie glanced at him with a hint of a smile and cocked her head. Carson, you will never truly grasp how much you mean to me. I can say the same thing of you, my lady, Carson said in response, trying to remain calm, though his pulse began to race. Lizzie glanced at him, and a smile slowly formed on her lips. I prefer you addressing me as Lizzie. As do I, Carson agreed, and took another swig of wine to fortify his courage. He swallowed hastily and grimaced. This truly is ghastly. Please do stop complaining, Lizzie scoffed, or I will be forced to take it from you and drink the lot myself. Be my guest. Carson chuckled and handed the bottle back to her. A short and strangely comfortable silence filled the stable, which was broken by Lizzie's soft sigh. Carson, may I ask you a question? Of course. You may ask me anything you wish. Do you feel out of place at times? As if everyone in the entire world is carrying on with their lives and you are left behind as if you have not accomplished anything meaningful in your life. Lizzie's tone was sombre, and her eyes dulled with sadness. I feel that way quite often. More often than I would care to admit. But you always seem very light-hearted and happy, Lizzie muttered with a furrowed brow. Apparently I have the tendency, and the skill, to hide my emotions from the rest of the world. Carson sighed and lowered his gaze. 
it is both a blessing and a curse. If only she knew how I really felt about her. It would seem we are more alike than we already thought we were, Lizzie said, as she nudged his arm with her elbow. Indeed, my lady. Here, Lizzie said with a giggle and handed him the bottle. It appears as though you need it more than I do. Despite its ghastly nature, we shall share it. Equally, Carson told her as he wrapped his fingers around the neck of the bottle. Lizzie's hand was directly below his, also wrapped around the bottle. I would love that, Lizzie whispered and lowered her gaze. Carson, do you remember the summer's day we rode our horses to the river? Of course. That day had been one of the best of his life. He was glad Lizzie seemed to remember it, too. It had started to rain and we took refuge under a tree. We spent the entire day there, only returning after sunset. Your parents were furious. And he'd been scolded severely by both her parents and his father. But the scolding had been worth it. Indeed they were, Lizzie chuckled. It was a wonderful day. We spoke of so many things. Sitting here with you now reminds me of that day. Luckily, we are not soaked from the rain this time, Carson pointed out. Nor do I have to worry about being scolded by your parents this time. As soon as the words left his mouth, he regretted it. My sincerest apologies, Lizzie. I didn't mean to. It is fine, Carson. I know you didn't mean to hurt or upset me, Lizzie assured him. I do miss the times we shared when we were younger. You and William spend a lot of time together now, which makes me feel rather left out. Is that why you feel left behind? Carson asked. Partly, Lizzie answered, licking her lips. I was always under the impression I would be the first of my siblings to marry. I am a woman, after all. I never thought that both James and William would be wedded before me. She turned her body toward him, still holding the bottle. I am truly happy and delighted for them, but I cannot stop myself from feeling as though I will never find a man who gazes upon me the way James and William gaze at their wives. Carson's throat tightened and he swallowed uncomfortably. Lizzie, you must be patient. Love finds us when we expect it the least. That certainly applied in James and William's cases. Perhaps it shall be in the cards for me also, Lizzie said, then met his eyes with an intent gaze. And you as well. One can only hope. Carson sighed and handed the bottle back to Lizzie. He desperately wished he possessed the courage to tell her of his feelings for her. Now was most certainly not the right time. She was half sprung already from the wine. He was raised to be a gentleman and would certainly not take advantage of her when she was in a vulnerable state. A sudden thought occurred to him, and he said jokingly, Perhaps we should marry and give everyone in Somerset a reason to gossip. Lizzie went still before taking another sip of wine. As if there are not already enough tales of me around town. The tales will be there regardless of your actions, Lizzie, Carson pointed out. Indeed, Lizzie answered, then turned to look at him. If by next spring neither of us is married, then I will take you up on your offer. You will? He gaped at her. Was she serious? His heart fluttered strangely in his chest, and he felt as if he couldn't catch his breath. Why not? I am certainly happier when I am with you than on my own. You make my heart light, Carson, Lizzie answered, and drank from the bottle before handing it back to him. I am glad to hear that, Carson smiled and lightly shook the bottle. This is nearly empty. Perhaps you should return to the ballroom and find us a fuller one, Lizzie suggested. Carson glanced at Lizzie, her eyes twinkling mischievously back. Please, Lizzie pouted, batting her lashes at him. 
I am certainly going to regret this in the morning. Carson grinned before taking another sip of the almost empty bottle of wine. Liar! Lizzie giggled as Carson stood from the hay bale. Come along. Carson held out his hand to her. Her facial expression changed into one of disbelief, and he shook his head. I am most certainly not becoming a wine thief on my own. Lizzie giggled again as she stood from the hay bale and took his hand. Lead the way. Chapter 3 A thunderous pain erupted inside Lizzie's head as she opened her eyes, so she immediately shut them again. Her bedchamber was filled with sunlight. She pulled the blanket over her head with a very unladylike groan. Carson's words echoed painfully through her mind. I am certainly going to regret this in the morning. Indeed, Lizzie moaned from under the blankets. A soft knock which bolted through her skull, ripping its way through, caused her to wince and she placed her hand against her forehead. Leave me be. My lady, it is Francis. His grace instructed me to bring your breakfast to your bedchamber. Please, my lady, will you allow me in? Lizzie's shoulders relaxed and she threw the blanket off her face. She slowly sat upright, her entire world spinning around her as the pulsating throb continued inside her head. Nausea swirled in her stomach and she had to fight not to flop back onto the bed and pull the blanket back over her. My lady? Francis asked again on the other side of the door. Yes, yes, come in, Lizzie answered in a hoarse tone. The door slowly opened and Francis entered, along with another young maidservant carrying a tray of food and tea. They quietly set it down on the table and the young maidservant quickly exited the bedchamber, as though she knew she was not welcome inside for very long. Thank you, Francis. Lizzie muttered with gratitude as she rubbed her temples. His and her grace had begun to worry about why you had not come out from your chambers, my lady, Francis explained as she slowly poured the teapot's contents into the teacup. I am still alive if that was what they were concerned about, Lizzie mumbled, and her brow furrowed. Francis? Yes, my lady? How did I get back to the estate? Lizzie asked. I cannot recall a single memory of it. I assume I returned with the Duke and the Duchess. Oh no, my lady. His and her grace arrived at the estate long before you did. Lizzie's brow furrowed even more, and she winced painfully. How long? What time did I, uh... Shortly before sunrise? Frances straightened from her task and looked at her. There was no censure in her maidservant's gaze, only concern. Lizzie gaped at her. Sunrise? Was I... Completely and utterly, my lady, Francis answered. It is no wonder you slept until now. Lizzie cleared her throat and ran her fingers through her brown hair. What I meant to ask was, was I alone when I returned? No, indeed. Mr. Wallace was so kind as to ensure my lady's safe return to the estate, Francis answered simply. Is there anything else, my lady? No, thank you, Francis. Lizzie sat in silence as Francis swiftly left her chambers and closed the door behind her. The silence brought forth the nauseating feeling again in the pit of Lizzie's stomach and she slid off the bed toward the delicious food Francis had brought in. Perhaps eating something would settle her. As she nibbled on the small bread loaves and occasionally sipped her tea, she recalled what she could of the previous night. She remembered the stables with Carson and the bottle of wine. How they'd sat and spoken of everything and anything and shared the bottle of bitter wine between them. Although, to be fair, she had drunk the lion's share of the bottle she remembered now. She recalled his facial expression as he took the first sip and realised why she felt terrible this morning. Carson was right, the wine was indeed awful. It must have been that. 
Then Lizzie recalled how they had returned to the ballroom and taken two more bottles before retreating back to their shared hay bale once more. Oh dear. They had demolished not one, but three bottles of wine between them. The memories spilled together in a haze, and she was even more perplexed than before. What had happened after that? Had she and Carson done anything untoward that she would hear about from people in Somerset? Was her reputation now even more tainted by her reckless and inappropriate behaviour? Lizzie stood from the chaise, swallowed another mouthful of tea, and hastily dressed herself in a white muslin daydress. After pinning her tresses up into a bun on the crown of her head, she left her bedchamber in search of the Duke. Surely he would inform her of any scandalous things she had done last evening, as he was at the ball as well. If not, she would be forced to go directly to the source, Carson. Lizzie reached the main stairwell and heard voices drifting up from downstairs. She drew in a deep breath as her hand rested on the banister and she slowly descended the staircase. Walking along the hallway, she heard the Duke and Duchess in the parlour and slowly entered. Good heavens, she is alive, her brother James announced as soon as his gaze met hers. His smile was filled with amusement. The Duchess, Kitty, however, seemed relieved rather than amused that Lizzie was awake and in a somewhat presentable state. Barely. I feel as though I have been struck by a coach, Lizzie admitted. That is not surprising, sister. Judging by the condition in which you arrived at the estate earlier this morning, I didn't expect anything less. It was very gentlemanly of Carson to escort you home. Lizzie nodded. Indeed. I wish to thank him personally for ensuring that I returned home safely. Before you do so, sister, perhaps we can discuss the events of last evening, the Duchess said hastily. Lizzie froze. There was a note in Kitty's voice that sounded faintly ominous. What on earth had she done? Heat flushed her cheeks as she tried in vain to remember. Very well, she answered, knowing there would be no point in delaying this conversation. She must have done something she certainly should not have. Something shocking or scandalous. Her thoughts trailed back to Carson. He would not have allowed her to do anything that may have tainted her reputation, surely. Carson was a kind and understanding man whom she trusted implicitly and he was well aware of the situation with her and Lord Dorset. Certainty filled her. Carson would not have let her behaviour go too far, she was sure of it. But that did not mean she was blameless. She spoke quickly to Kitty. Before you say anything, Your Grace, I wish only to apologise for any of my behaviour that placed you both in a bad light. I was clearly intoxicated and had no control over what I had done. I do apologise if there was anything I have done that made you ashamed to call me your sister. Oh no, Lizzie, the Duchess said with a reassuring smile. She approached Lizzie and patted her arm. You didn't do anything of the sort. Although James and I did see you and Carson leave the ballroom, each with a bottle of wine in hand. Lizzie closed her eyes and hung her head in shame. I cannot believe I did such a thing, especially with all the lies flying around about me at the present time. I don't believe anyone else saw your little escape. It was rather skillfully done, sister, the Duke grinned. I must commend you and Carson on that. Thank you, Lizzie said wryly. I think. Do not be so serious, sister. Nothing bad happened. No one even noticed the wine bottles were missing. There is no need to fret over it. We all know Carson would also not allow you to do anything outlandish and irresponsible. He feels. The Duchess cleared her throat, interrupting the Duke, who pursed his lips briefly. He cares for your safety and your well-being too much to allow anything to happen to you, the Duke said, after a short pause. Lizzie narrowed her eyes. 
What had her brother been about to say when Kitty stopped him? But the Duchess was speaking, distracting her from her train of thought. You are truly lucky to have a friend such as Carson, Kitty said. Indeed. He has been my saving grace for a long time, last evening included, and I feel it is only proper to thank him for that, Lizzie said. Kitty smiled at her and nodded. I spoke with Carson earlier last evening, before you vanished and reappeared shortly before dawn at the estate. He is a charming and wonderful young man. Careful, the Duke warned his wife playfully. I may start to feel envious of Carson if you continue to speak so fondly of him, my love. The Duchess rolled her eyes and chuckled at the Duke's remark. Fear not, my dearest. You are the only man for me. Lizzie pursed her lips and raised a brow. The Duchess winked at the Duke before turning back to Lizzie. He also spoke very fondly and kindly of you, my sister. He is a wonderful man, and I am truly grateful to have him in my life, Lizzie said with sincerity. Even if he was the one who suggested taking the two bottles of wine. I do not believe that. I am well aware of your fondness for wine, the Duke smirked. Honestly, James, you make me sound as though I am permanently intoxicated. Lizzie groaned with exasperation. More often than not, I would say. The Duke chuckled and glanced at the Duchess. Now, now, it is not proper to make fun of your sister in such a manner, the Duchess interjected. Thank you, Your Grace, Lizzie told Kitty and glanced at her brother. Listen to your wife. At least she does not constantly tease me. It is my right to tease you, as your older brother, of course, the Duke proclaimed. I am merely worried that we will not be able to marry you off because of your love of wine. Your teasing is starting to turn rather insulting, James, Lizzie muttered, and her eyes narrowed. I am leaving now. Before you leave, sister, the Duke called, as Lizzie was about to turn away. Yes she asked with a sigh. We would like to share something with you, the Duchess said slowly. Lizzie noticed the expression on the Duchess's face change slightly, and her eyes instantly widened. Is something the matter? No, we simply wish to discuss something with you. Very well. Lizzie, you know that you are always welcome here at the estate, and... Lizzie's heart skipped a beat. Do you wish me to leave? She stared at her brother and new sister, dumbfounded. Was she in the way of their love? Surely not. They couldn't possibly. She swallowed, unable to fathom the idea of having to go and live somewhere else. No, we simply... Simply what? You no longer want me here because I did something that you both know of, but will not tell me. What did I do last evening? Lizzie asked, her voice breaking as her eyes filled with tears. Kitty shook her head and smiled kindly. You didn't do a thing wrong. James and I have been discussing this for a while now, and we simply think that you should consider acting more... more appropriately, as it would please the masses. Is that what you both think of me? Lizzie demanded of her family. Sister, you know that we love you, James said. Do you? Yet you wish me to act unlike myself. Love was meant to be unconditional. If they wanted her to change and pretend to be something she was not, then how was that unconditional? Despite her resolve to stay in control, a tear slipped down her cheek. Then another followed. She sniffed and dashed a hand across her face, trying to stop the trickle before it became a flood. James tapped a finger to his chin before saying, Lizzie, please do not be upset with us. We do love you and accept you for who you are, but don't you wish to marry and start a family of your own? Lizzie glanced down at the Duchess's hand cradling her swollen belly and pursed her lips again.
she suddenly understood what the Duchess and the Duke meant, and why they were urging her to marry now, when it hadn't seemed to matter in the past. They didn't want her reputation to negatively impact their child. She would be known as the foxed aunt who could not find a husband, as she was too scandalous to marry. No man wished to have a woman such as her, at least not long term. Lizzie blinked, and another tear ran down her cheek. She hastily wiped it away and glanced at the Duchess. You do not need to worry about me being a bad influence on your child, Kitty. That is not what we said, Lizzie, James pointed out. You didn't need to. Your faces reveal it all. I understand your concern, as the needs of your child come first. It is what comes naturally to a parent. I don't wish to get in the way of that, so I will be out of your hair soon enough, Lizzie answered, and yet she felt as if her heart was breaking. This was her home. It had always been so. This was where she had been happiest, playing as a child with Carson in the grounds and daydreaming about him once she became an adult. She didn't want to leave. Kitty's gaze was concerned. Lizzie! It is all right, she raised her chin. James, Kitty, you don't need to flatter me with flowery words. I am aware of the rumours about me. Everyone is. I know they're not true, and I will carry on living in the manner I see fit, because I know the truth. I alone get to decide what I do with my life. Lizzie sighed and glanced at her brother. James, you of all people should be aware of how I feel about marriage. I do not feel the need to change myself for a man who will not love me for the person I am. I don't care whether I am not what men want in a wife. If I am destined to be a spinster and grow old alone, then so be it. But I will not change for anyone. Lizzie didn't wait for a response from either the Duke or the Duchess. She swiftly turned away and left the parlour. She didn't care to hear what they had to say, as nothing they could possibly say would change her mind or make her feel differently. She hurried through the hallway that led to the terrace. Hot tears stung her eyes, blurring her vision, but she would not allow her grief to consume her. Never again. Chapter 4 a grin formed on Carson's lips as he recalled the evening he had spent with Lizzie and the laughter and sense of happiness in his carriage on the way home from the ball. He glanced at himself in the mirror as he dressed for breakfast with his sister, Miss Adrienne. They didn't often spend time together, as Adrienne spent most of her time volunteering at a hospital in Somerset, something her father had encouraged her to do from a very young age. Her heart had always been devoted to helping people and caring for them. There was nothing she wouldn't do in order to help someone. Carson had great admiration for his older sister, as she had found her one true passion, and it seemed to bring her joy. Carson flattened his waistcoat against his shirt and stepped away from the mirror. The memories of last evening flashed before his eyes, and he could practically taste the wine he and Lizzie had shared in the stable. Although he cringed at the remembrance of that terrible wine, he could not have asked for a better evening. They had spoken of so many things throughout the rest of the night, as if they were still young children without any troubles or woes, sharing laughter and giggles. They'd consumed the wine until Lizzie had started to hiccup and giggle, their shared amusement at the strange sounds coming from her even more intoxicating than the wine. Of course, Lizzie had been more foxed than Carson, rightfully so, considering her diminutive size and inexperience with liquor. But she had been utterly delightful, childlike and innocent in her fun. Her words of truth still resonated in his mind. Their night of conversation and laughter in the stables had been far more fun than anything they could have done if they had officially stayed at the ball inside the manor house. Carson recalled ushering her to his coach, his arm around her waist in order to keep her upright and stop her from tipping over. She giggled as she spoke muddled words that amused her to no end, and even though he could hardly understand her, 
he'd still been mesmerised with her. He closed his eyes for a moment, recalling her beauty and how difficult it had been not to kiss her. Her long brown tresses had loosely tumbled down her narrow shoulders, her lips stained red from the wine. The coach journey was even more entertaining than the stable, as they had reminisced more about their childhood, bringing forth even more chuckles and laughter. There had been countless moments where Carson had to fight the urge not to lean in and kiss Lizzie, but he was well aware that action would have been wrong, given her level of inebriation. He could not possibly live with himself if he had taken advantage of her in such a vulnerable state. Also, he was certain that Lizzie would not have remembered anything. That, however, would have made taking advantage of her that much more despicable. Despite spending the entire night with Lizzie, he hadn't been able to disclose his feelings for her. He was rather upset and disappointed in himself for not being forthcoming earlier before they had started on that second bottle. Had he not tortured himself long enough by keeping his feelings locked up deep inside? Maybe it was time to grab his courage by the horns and tell her his true feelings. Carson drew in a breath as he left his bedchamber and made his way down the large stairwell to the parlour. His sister adored that space, and it was where she often requested breakfast to be served. The room was bright as he entered, and the table in the centre of the room was already packed to the brim with delicious-looking breakfast fare. A small platoon could be fed with the amount of food on the table, but he expected no less from his sister. The scent of fresh roses suddenly filled the air, and he heard footsteps behind him. Adrienne stood in the doorway, holding a vase stuffed full with the beautiful flowers, and smiling brightly at Carson over the top of the bouquet. Good morning, brother, she greeted cheerfully, walking past him and placing the vase on the mantel. I do hope you're hungry. Hungry, Carson muttered. With this much food, I ought to be famished. It is not every day that I can enjoy a breakfast with my dear brother, Adrienne shrugged and glanced at him. Carson narrowed his eyes, knowing his sister well enough to see that there was a hidden agenda behind her perfectly poised smile. What is the matter? Nothing is the matter. Can I not simply enjoy a meal with you? Adrienne asked as she sat at the table. Now sit. Carson reluctantly sat at the table as well, his gaze lingering on his sister. What sort of scheming was on her mind? But instead of attacking the problem head-on, he decided to start with his sister's favourite topic. Are you still enjoying yourself at the hospital, Adrienne? As expected, Adrienne's eyes sparkled at the mention of the beloved hospital, and she nodded with great enthusiasm. Indeed, Carson. If there is one place that brings me constant joy, it is the hospital. It is truly life-changing once a person finds their passion and a vocation for which they were meant. I simply cannot tire of expressing my love for what I do every day. Carson grinned, glad for her. He admired the passion Adrienne felt from helping people at the hospital and wondered whether he'd ever have the opportunity to speak so passionately of something he loved. As Adrienne continued to share amusing tales of the patients she'd helped since the last time he had seen her, he quietly listened to her while his thoughts wondered. How would Lizzie be feeling this morning? Would she be dreadfully unwell? And would she recall all the details of the previous evening? Despite the night being long, he remembered every single moment of it. There was no better way to spend a tedious ball than with Lizzie, whether she was foxed on wine or not. If she was feeling under the weather, he hoped it would not be too bad for her. Hopefully she would not blame him, since she had been the one who had suggested taking two bottles of wine from the ballroom instead of one. Are you even listening to me, Carson? Adrienne's voice echoed through the room, and Carson blinked before glancing at her with a furrowed brow. Where did you disappear to, brother? Adrienne demanded, after he made no attempt to respond. My apologies, sister. 
I am rather distracted this morning. I can certainly see that, she answered, and lowered her gaze. Your excursion at Lord and Lady Wheeling's must have been, without a doubt, exhausting. Carson glared at his sister and cocked his head. I beg your pardon. Do not act the fool, brother. I am well aware of the company you kept last evening, Adrienne stated. As is everyone else. Do you think it is wise to be in the vicinity of that woman for more than a few minutes? Anger tightened Carson's gut. And what precisely do you mean by that? he asked, though his chest constricted with a premonition that this conversation was about to take a turn for the worse. I am not foolish, nor am I oblivious to the happenings in town, Carson. People talk, and the things I have heard with regards to Lizzie and her antics with Lord Dorset, not even to mention her scandalous behaviour last evening. I simply can't believe that you were involved as well. Pilfering wine from the ballroom. Adrienne clucked her tongue and shook her head. You should not be in the company of such a woman. You are not aware of what her intentions with you are, Carson. To laugh and talk and drink with me. I wish her intentions were more than that when it came to me. You are certainly a fool for believing those Banbury stories, Adrienne. Carson loudly placed his spoon on the saucer. Furthermore, Lizzie did nothing to earn such disrespect from you, nor me. You are worried about the wrong person. I have known Lizzie for a long while, as you know, and she is not how Somerset describes her. They do not know her as I do. And nor do you, by the sound of it. I'm actually shocked by you, Adrienne. You should know better than to listen to malicious gossip. Adrienne lifted her nose, clearly unfazed by his rebuke. I am merely saying that it might hurt your reputation if you continue to keep company with her. You will be associated with her, and your reputation may be sullied, and I would not wish for that to happen, Carson. Father would roll over in his grave if he found out you were placing the integrity of our family at risk, Adrienne stated flatly. After what Mother did? Impossible. What nonsense you speak, Adrienne, Carson growled. Lizzie has more integrity in her little finger than any of those ladies in attendance last evening. Why do you defend her? she demanded. Because she is my friend, and I care for her very much. Adrienne cocked her head once more and momentarily narrowed her eyes. You are in love with her. She said it as a statement, not a question. Carson straightened his spine, unwilling to admit to anything with Adrienne. Not before he had had a chance to talk to Lizzie about how he felt. I am not. I simply wish for her to be treated as the wonderful woman she is. She is a good person who has had a bunch of malicious lies spread about her, and she does not deserve to be shunned by the very women who profess to be her friends mere months before. Shame on all of them. And shame on you if you believe those lies, too. Adrienne blinked a few times, but did not speak. Carson could see in her eyes that she was mildly offended by his words, but neither of the siblings uttered another sound for several minutes. Carson bent his head and angrily shoved food into his mouth. He would not give way on this matter. Lizzie's integrity was not something to be challenged. Not by anyone. Finally, his sister went on. Regardless of what I think, or whether I believe the tales that have been making their rounds in town, I merely wish for you to think of what is best for you. You mean for the family name? Carson, we were raised by the same father, with the same morals and the same rules. You are well aware of what father would say if he were here today, Adrienne said softly, and drew in a deep breath. Which is why I have taken it upon myself to arrange a meeting with a lovely young woman I met while... No. There was no way he was being set up for some sort of arranged marriage. 
The only woman he wanted in his home, his life and his bed, was Lizzie Seymour. And if she didn't want him, then he would settle for nobody. Would you please allow me to finish? Adrienne asked, and shifted her cup of tea closer. I am not meeting with a woman I do not know, Adrienne. His sister smiled brightly. She is lovely, Carson. Her name is Miss Violet Saunders. She is a very intelligent young lady, the daughter of the chief magistrate in the neighbouring county. No, Adrienne. She is soft-spoken and has a beautiful mane of golden hair. She plays the violin and the piano. Sounds boring. Adrienne, please stop. Why? She is precisely the kind of woman who would be perfectly suited to you. How would his sister know what suited him? You are well aware of my feelings in regards to marriage. Not all marriages end like mother and father's, Carson. It is rather unfair to compare all marriages to one that failed, Adrienne argued. At that moment in time, it was the only one that mattered. Carson stood from the table with annoyance tightening his gut. He glared at Adrienne. My answer is no. I will not meet with Miss Saunders. I cannot say it more plainly than that. That is a pity, Adrienne shrugged and glanced at the grandfather clock in the corner of the parlour, as she is expected to arrive here shortly before dinner this evening. Carson glared at his sister and his jaw clenched. You are a manipulative and self-righteous woman who does not care about anyone else's opinions or feelings other than your own. Father would be proud of me, Adrienne answered nonchalantly as she sipped her tea. Well, I'm not. Carson stepped from the table and drew in a deep breath as he turned away. Where are you going? I need some air, Carson answered with a grumble. Please do ensure that you are back in time for Miss Violet's arrival, Adrienne answered with a smile, which made Carson even angrier. He stormed out of the parlour, slamming the door behind him. The sound still echoed through the hallway as he retreated all the way to the main entrance. Chapter 5 the fresh air and the delectable scent of the flowers in a porcelain vase perched in the centre of the table soothed the pounding inside Lizzie's head. She was seated quietly on the terrace, immersed in a daze. Her memories of last evening were still rather unclear, and it seemed as though the harder she tried to retrieve them, the quicker they evaporated into the light. A cool breeze softly brushed her cheeks, providing much-needed relief from the heat that filled her body at regular intervals. A crystal glass with cold water stood on the table in front of her. The droplets on the outside of the glass sparkled like rainbow-hued diamonds, then slowly trailed down onto the wooden table. She saw movement out of the corner of her eye and turned that way, leaving her hazy dream world. She drew in a breath and her limbs stiffened as she noticed Carson, looking rather dashing as always, making his way across the lawn toward her. Much to her surprise, her heart pounded in her chest and she was unable to tear her eyes away from him. What on earth is happening? But in all honesty, she had known for a very long time what was happening and had tucked her feelings for Carson away as a foolish dream. Until now. Had something occurred last evening that caused all these ancient feelings to rise to the surface once more? Lizzie was not bold enough to simply ask Carson. Was she? Good morning, my lady. Carson greeted her with a charming smile, but somehow the smile didn't quite reach his eyes. How are you feeling this morning? Not too well, I'm afraid. It feels as though a coach rode over my head while I was asleep. Carson nodded encouragingly and approached the table. May I join you? Certainly, Mr. Wallace. Carson's brow furrowed, yet an amused grin lifted his lips. I see we have resorted back to formalities. 
I wasn't certain whether it would be appropriate to address you otherwise, Lizzie answered, biting her lip. She couldn't quite meet his eyes. Did she dare ask? And why would it be inappropriate? You have addressed me by my first name for many years, Carson stated. Because of last evening and early this morn, Lizzie admitted. My memory seems to fail me, and I have no recollection of what happened after we returned to the ballroom. Apparently we stole two more bottles of wine, and I wasn't delivered home until dawn. The wines were entirely upon your insistence, Carson chuckled and glanced at her. What is really the matter, Lizzie? I feel rather ashamed with regards to my behaviour, Carson. I didn't intend to drag you into the mess I made by acting so inappropriately. Lizzie answered her friend as truthfully as she could. You did no such thing, Carson insisted. And I must admit that I have not had such an enjoyable evening in a very long while. Truly? Lizzie asked, surprised. Truly, my dearest Lizzie, Carson answered. You cannot recall the rest of the evening at all. Not in the least, she answered. Can you? I remember everything, Carson answered, and a sudden intensity lit up his eyes. We... I mean, you and I, we didn't. Oh, this was impossible. Lizzie stopped stammering and swallowed hard. How did one ask such a thing? Understanding dawned in Carson's eyes. No, Lizzie. You need not worry about that, he assured her. Nothing untoward happened in relation to you and I. Partly, Lizzie was relieved that nothing intimate had happened between them, as she would have preferred to remember such an encounter. And partly she was disappointed that Carson had not thought of kissing her. Perhaps he didn't think of her in such a manner at all, which was rather disappointing to consider. Or perhaps Carson was merely saying so to avoid any awkward questions from her. Was that what you were worried about? Carson inquired. Indeed. I wished to visit you at your home, but I was not certain whether it was safe for me to do so. By now the entire county is aware of how I behaved last evening, apparently. And I am well aware that your sister did not think very highly of me, even before all these latest scandals, Lizzie sighed. Miss Adrienne had made it no secret that she was not fond of Lizzie, even from years prior. She had constantly reminded Carson that they were from different worlds and that women such as Lizzie expected a certain kind of life that Carson would never be able to give her. Even while talking of Lizzie's status in society, Lizzie had always gotten the impression that Adrienne felt herself superior to Lizzie. There was a look in her eye that hinted Lizzie would never be good enough for her dear brother, Carson. She tended to agree with Adrienne in some ways. Carson was a dear man, and he did not deserve to be lumbered with Lizzie's scandalous baggage. Despite all those things, however, he had chosen to be friends with Lizzie and spend time with her, and for that she was truly grateful. My sister does not dictate whom I can and cannot have in my life, Carson muttered. And I enjoy spending time with you. Her breath caught in her throat at the declaration. After being rebuffed so often recently by those she'd thought to be her friends, it was heartwarming to know that she could count on Carson. No matter what. And I enjoy spending time with you as well, Carson, whether I remember it or not, Lizzie chuckled. Do you recall that we made a pact that if neither one of us are married or betrothed by next spring, we would marry each other? Carson inquired. His reminder made her blush, heat flooding her cheeks. It is one of the few things I do recall, yes, Lizzie answered sheepishly. I hope you didn't find it a tad desperate. Carson waved his hand in the air. Please, stop fretting. Nothing you do could ever make me see you in a bad light. I promise you that. 
Lizzie's heart began to pound in her chest once more. She truly hoped that Carson would know how deeply his words affected her. How she desperately wished that he would embrace her and kiss her in the manner she had always dreamed he would. But alas, it had not happened last night, and it did not happen now. That is certainly good to hear, Lizzie forced herself to say. I am certain your sister does not feel the same. I can say the same for your brothers, Carson chuckled. His grace and will, although very good friends of mine, are certainly not to be countered. What makes matters worse is that you are their younger sister, and I allowed you to return home in such a state. I would expect that I am currently in their bad books on that front. My brothers are harmless, Lizzie grinned with amusement. Are they here, at the estate? Carson asked, as he glanced in the direction of the long hallway that led to the great hall. Lizzie laughed once more and shook her head. You do not need to fret over them. They are very fond of you and very grateful that you took it upon yourself to ensure that I arrived home safely. The Duke wishes to thank you personally, but he has not had the time to do so. Sudden sadness filled her and her lips drooped as she remembered the conversation earlier with her brother. He and the Duchess are too busy in their efforts to evict me from Woodlock Manor. Evict you? Carson asked, his tone showing his disbelief. That sounds very unlikely. Why would they wish to do such a thing? They don't want me here when the baby is born, which is soon. I guess I am not the kind of aunt they would prefer for their child. Lizzie sighed, her heart tugging in pain. I think I might have to be one of those aunts who lives far away and only visits occasionally. She didn't want that at all. She wanted to be around while her family grew. She didn't want to leave because they were ashamed of her. It was shocking that it had come to this, and even though the thought of leaving filled her with sadness, she understood. James and Kitty were doing what they needed to do to ensure their child would never have a tarnished reputation. Did they say that? he asked quietly. Not in those exact words, of course, but they didn't need to, Carson. It was written on their faces as clear as day, Lizzie answered. A quiet moment passed between them. What are you going to do? Carson asked eventually. Lizzie slanted her gaze to the man she'd idolised since he was a boy. Did she dare say it, even as a joke? Perhaps I can stay with you. The words rushed out of her, and even though she kept her tone light, there was something more in his gaze when he stared back at her. She laughed to break the tension. That would most certainly give everyone in Somerset something to talk about, she said. Adrienne's heart would stop. Carson grinned back at her, his eyes twinkling. But the something was still there, and it caused her breath to catch. Indeed, he said. Adrienne would not be best pleased. Lizzie's chuckle faded, and she cleared her throat. In all honesty, I am not certain what my next step will be. Perhaps I should accept my fate and behave like the proper young woman everyone expects me to be. Find a man who wants the prestige of marrying into the Duke's family and be done with it. That is not who you are, Lizzie, Carson said, flicking his hand dismissively. Lizzie stared at him with narrowed eyes. Did he really just say that? Is he hinting that I cannot be a proper young lady? Carson sat up straight, as if he'd just realised how his comments sounded, and said quickly, I meant that in the most honourable manner possible. Settling for less is not who you are. That is what I meant. You cannot pretend to be someone you are not, Lizzie. You and I both know this. Perhaps it is time I changed something of myself, as I have not had any good fortune with being who I am now, Lizzie said, lifting her nose high in the air. She was still slightly miffed about the almost insult. Do not dare utter such nonsense. You are perfect the way you are, Carson defended. 
and you should not allow any person to make you feel as though you are not worthy, least of all my sister. Lizzie relaxed somewhat at his words, though she shook her head. I am surprised that she has not found you a wife already. A slight hint of hesitation in Carson's manner caused her to cock her head and study him more intently. Her brow furrowed. What was that about? While we are on the subject, my lady, Carson said, as he glanced at her, his eyes darkening. My sister has lost her mind and taken it upon herself to arrange a meeting with Miss Violet Saunders. It is not of my doing, but I wanted you to hear it from me first, in case any talk reaches you. Lizzie searched her memory. That name rang a bell somewhere. The chief magistrate's daughter, Lizzie inquired, as she disguised her surprise by raising her glass of water to her lips. Indeed. Why? Of all the people to introduce to Carson, why Violet Saunders? Adrienne is under the impression that we will make a delightful couple. Cold water spewed from Lizzie's mouth in an icy spray. Carson glanced at her in horror, but only for a moment. Then a smile formed on his lips as he reached for her face and wiped drips of water from her chin. That was precisely the reaction I would have given at that moment if the situation were reversed, Carson said. Lizzie reached for her handkerchief that lay in the pocket of her dress. She quickly dabbed at the parts of her wet face that Carson's thumb had missed, still feeling the heated tingle of his touch. What did you tell her? she demanded. Adrienne couldn't possibly be thinking of Violet for Carson's bride. They were so ill-matched. Why, they were as ill-matched as, as... Her thoughts tumbled furiously as Lord Dorset and myself. I have never met the young woman, which makes me even more unsettled, but Adrienne is as persistent as she is caring. I had no choice in the matter, Carson sighed and glanced at Lizzie. It does not upset you, does it? Beyond the water spitting, that is. He grinned at her, and Lizzie's cheeks heated as she placed the glass on the table. Why would that upset me? You know very well that I wish for you to be happy. Lizzie could not help but feel utterly disappointed by this turn of events. Perhaps if she had the courage to make her feelings for him known, she would not be sitting here on the terrace, hearing of this meeting he now had with Miss Violet Saunders. A meeting that could potentially lead to a future marriage. Lizzie was aware how insistent and persistent Adrienne was, and Lizzie was quite certain that she would do anything and everything to ensure that Carson married a woman she saw as fitting. Adrienne was wrong. Miss Violet was not a good fit for Carson at all, but it was certainly not Lizzie's place to tell him that. She'd probably appear jealous and spiteful. In her heart, she tried to convince herself that she was neither of those things. But the multitude of emotions bubbling up inside her, Anger, disappointment, guilt, disbelief, resentment, sadness, loneliness, caused her to pause. It had become increasingly obvious to her that Carson meant much more to her than she'd originally thought. But he was her friend, nothing more. And shouldn't she be happy for her friend if he were to find happiness with a woman? Even if that woman was not Lizzie at all, but someone completely new. Someone like Miss Violet Saunders. Adrienne is an intelligent woman, and she knows you well. Who better to choose a wife for you than her? Lizzie eventually said, forcing a smile. You overestimate her ability to know me, Lizzie, Carson said with a shake of his head. There is only one person in the world who knows me better than I know myself, Carson said, with a tender tone in his baritone voice and his eyes softened significantly. And that person is you. Lizzie's heart leapt, and she gripped her handkerchief in her lap tightly to stop herself from squealing or something else equally embarrassing. But it is not for me to decide whom you must marry. That choice is solely yours, is it not? Lizzie asked. 
We shall see, Carson muttered. I am, however, not optimistic with regard to the outcome of tonight's meeting. I do not believe that love and marriage can be forced. Well, of course, they can, but not usually with a happy outcome for the participants. I agree. Marriage is simply a terrible thing. If one falls in love and finds the one person they wish to spend the rest of their life alongside, then I do not object in the least. But forcing two people who have nothing in common to marry and pretend to be a happy family for the sake of appearances is simply foolish, Lizzie confessed. Her brothers had both found love, and she was happy for them. Marriage suited such alliances. But not everyone could be that lucky. I agree with you. It is simply a valued aspect of this world we find ourselves in, Carson mumbled. Perhaps you and I should escape this world. Clearly there is nothing for us here, Lizzie suggested. Next spring. Carson smiled at her, and an enormous swarm of butterflies fluttered in her stomach. The urge to kiss him came forth once more, but she fought it with every cell in her body. Now was not the time. Not when he was about to head off to meet a woman who might end up as his wife. But when would it be the right time for her and Carson? Would it ever be the right time? Chapter 6 Shadows had formed outside Carson's window as he stared out at Woodlock Manor in the distance. More specifically, the window of Lizzie's bedchamber. The flames of a lit chandelier flickered inside, and he wondered what Lizzie was doing. Whether she felt as nauseated as he by the fact that he would be meeting with Miss Saunders in a short while. He was not oblivious to the underlying emotions he'd seen in her eyes when he'd mentioned Miss Saunders and his sister's intention to marry him off to the chief magistrate's daughter. He knew Lizzie well enough to see that it had cut up her peace. In fact, the mere thought of this meeting had him feeling the same way. Carson was dressed in his formal dinner attire, with his hair perfectly parted to the side. Although he was not too enthusiastic about the planned evening, he'd still dressed respectfully. His father had enforced unshakable ethics and morals into him. Carson quietly left his chambers and made his way along the long hallway that led to the grand staircase. Downstairs, he could already hear Adrienne's voice speaking to their visitor, and Carson drew in a deep breath, preparing himself for the evening. As he reached the bottom of the stairwell, his thoughts immediately drifted to Lizzie, her beautiful smile, her infectious laughter, and her bright eyes. No one could compare to her. He entered the dining hall and found his sister and Miss Saunders standing beside the dinner table, speaking in animated tones. Brother! Adrienne beamed the moment she noticed him enter and turned to him. Carson smiled politely and approached the two young ladies. Good evening, sister. My dear brother, may I introduce the lovely Miss Violet Saunders? Adrienne chimed. Miss Violet! This is my dear brother, Mr. Carson Wallace. Good evening, Miss Saunders, Carson greeted with a polite smile. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance. Yours as well, Mr. Wallace, Miss Saunders reciprocated and held out her hand to Carson. As social intervention dictated, Carson took her hand, brought it to his lips and gently kissed her skin. She didn't react in any manner and simply nodded as she withdrew her hand from his. Carson wasn't certain whether she shared his feelings of wanting to be elsewhere, or if she was as repulsed by him as she appeared to be. Perhaps she was also in love with another, and she'd been forced by her father to be here. Miss Adrienne could not stop talking of you, Carson. I simply had to meet the man whom she made sound so intriguing, Miss Saunders said. I can assure you, my sister was exaggerating, Carson chuckled. Miss Saunders' forced laughter unsettled him, and as he glanced at a beaming Adrienne, his smile faded. 
didn't his sister see her friend's facade? She was as keen for this evening as he was, which was to say, not at all. I am rather famished, his sister said, and clasped her hands together. Shall we head in? They moved into the dining area and sat at the dinner table, and it was quiet for a moment, much to Carson's relief. It was only when Miss Saunders started to speak that he shifted uneasily in his chair, her voice grating on his ears. Admittedly, she was a beautiful young woman, with dark brown eyes framed with long lashes and flawless skin. Her golden hair gave her the appearance of a goddess, but there was something about Miss Saunders that didn't appeal to Carson. He was not certain what it was, but something didn't seem quite right. Mr. Wallace, your sister tells me that you are having the library renovated, Miss Saunders voiced. Indeed. Luckily, the carpenters only work until the sun goes down. The racket can be quite distracting, Carson answered with a nod. I can only imagine. Not to mention the dust and the mess. The visitor scowled. Father had our entire family home restored during the summer while Mother and I visited Greece. It was lovely there, although it was quite warm and uncomfortable at times. But lovely nonetheless. Do you like to travel, Mr. Wallace? At times, and with the right travel companion, Carson answered. Oh, I do agree. A good travel companion is worth their weight in gold. Nothing places a dampener on a holiday more than someone who does not care for the same things you do, Miss Saunders answered with a nod. Father allowed me to visit family in Ireland, but they sent my chambermaid with me, as mother and father had business to attend to here in Somerset and couldn't come along. My chambermaid is an older woman with rather stout features, not ideal for walking along the Irish countryside, may I say. She would complain so much, all the time, and it was infuriating. Breathing heavily, and the panting was irrationally loud. Carson's jaw dropped at the strange comment, and he glanced at Adrienne. His eyes met only a blank expression that gave nothing away. He was not certain how to react to the young woman's tale, which he found rather offensive. Clearly, she had neither compassion nor empathy for the older, plumper chambermaid, who probably had no interest in walking the roads she was forced down. Ireland is a beautiful place, he managed to say. Oh no, it was too cold for my liking. I could not stand to wear all those capes and coats. It is not at all flattering, Miss Saunders answered, and that was the end of that conversation. Carson sighed and then noticed Adrienne tapping her index finger on the table. He knew that telling move, and it almost made him laugh. His sister now regretted her decision. Not only was Miss Saunders uncouth and disrespectful toward people older than her and in lower positions, she was starting to annoy both his sister and him simply by her presence. For the duration of their dinner, Miss Saunders monopolised the conversation, not truly allowing either of the Wallace siblings to speak for longer than a few moments at a time. In the end, they simply sat at the table in awe of Miss Violet's verbal capacity. Or perhaps in a daze because of it. She spoke of herself and her own experiences so much that Carson became rather desperate for the night to end and not to ever have to endure her in his home ever again. Carson's gaze was cast downward and he was immersed in his own world, far away from Miss Saunders' prattle. To distract himself from his increasing frustration, he slowly ran his finger along the rim of his glass, wondering what Lizzie was doing at that moment. He stopped as soon as he noticed the silence around him. He looked up at their guest, who gazed at him expectantly. Had she asked him a question? Carson cleared his throat and straightened in his chair. My sincerest apologies, Miss Saunders. I do hate to interrupt your thoughts, Mr. Wallace. Clearly, they were much more important than being present with us, Miss Saunders admonished. Of course not, Miss Saunders, he assured her, though secretly he agreed wholeheartedly. Miss Adrienne spoke of the gardens, 
and I merely inquired whether you would be kind enough to show them to me now that we've finished dinner. Miss Saunders smiled, fluttering her lashes at him in a conspicuous manner. He tried not to cringe away. It would be my pleasure, he answered, forcing a smile to his lips and standing finally. Would you care to join us, Adrienne? I would not dream of interfering. This will allow you and Miss Saunders to become better acquainted, his sister answered. Would you not agree? Carson's jaw clenched for a moment and forced another smile. But his eyes were narrowed at his sister. Indeed. Lovely. Carson quietly escorted the verbose Miss Saunders from the dining hall through the short hallway that led to the terrace and outside. The pathway leading to the garden gate was bathed in a silver hue of moonlight as the full moon proudly shone against the dark blue velvet sky. The air was fresh and cool, but it was a pleasant evening. It was rather strange to walk along the pathway between the flowers and the trees with someone other than Lizzie. Carson realized suddenly why he felt unsettled in this woman's presence. It was not simply because she only spoke of herself and sounded like the most selfish person in the entire world. It was because she was not Lizzie. Miss Saunders didn't have the same bright hue of green in her eyes that Lizzie had, nor did she have a dimple in her cheek that made its appearance as soon as she smiled. Miss Saunders' laugh was forced and didn't seem genuine at all, and there was a knowing calculation in her gaze all the while. Lizzie's laughter was infectious, and he could not help but join in whenever she laughed. But most of all, Lizzie's presence completed Carson. He didn't feel alone when he was beside her. The inner loneliness, however, was evident as he strode beside Miss Saunders, who seemed to be in her own little world, which revolved entirely around herself. Not even in his darkest or most desperate moments would he ever consider courting Miss Saunders, and he would definitely never consider marrying her. Not for a moment. His sister had made a terrible error in judgment on his behalf, and he was certainly going to inform her of it as soon as Miss Saunders departed. Mr. Wallace. Carson. He glanced at his guest immediately, feeling most uncomfortable about the fact that she had used his first name. But he didn't wish to appear rude once more and answered, Yes, Miss Saunders. Violet, please. He inclined his head, but he did not use her name. Is there something the matter? Am I boring you? she inquired. No, of course not. I was merely thinking of my late father. He adored these gardens and had ensured they were properly cared for. I recall those days, before my mother left, when he would come here and be lost in his own world. My mother would have to practically drag him by the collar to return to the manor house. Carson smiled sadly, the memories of his father, and mother for that matter, genuinely flooding his mind and his heart. Father informed me of your mother and father's situation, and it was quite the scandal all those years ago. It is not common practice for a married man and wife to have their marriage nullified, as father said. Carson straightened, putting both hands behind his back. Could we please speak of something other than my parents' failed marriage? Certainly. But along the topic of marriage, what is your opinion on it? Miss Saunders inquired. Carson drew in a deep and wearisome breath and noticed the wooden bench nearby. Perhaps we could sit. That would be lovely, she answered. They approached the bench and sat down. My parents' marriage affected me more than it should have, and more than I thought it would. I am rather sceptical to engage in the process of courting, betrothal, and marriage as a result. As you think you will end up as your parents have? she asked, raising her brows. Carson pursed his lips and leaned back against the backrest of the bench. In a manner of speaking, I suppose. I was raised to believe that everything that happens in our lives serves a purpose and will be understood in time. But my parents' separation was one of the few things in my life that had no purpose. 
Our lives didn't become better after it happened. My father was miserable until the day he passed, and I am not even certain where my mother is now. If she is still, in fact, alive. My parents' marriage was the result of an agreement between their parents, and it didn't turn out well. Marriage should be between two people who love one another from the start, accept each other as they are, and be willing to compromise to live happily together. Miss Saunders shook her head at him. That is a strange mindset to have in this world in which we live, Carson. Again, his name on her lips made him flinch. But it does not make it untrue, she continued. And while Father will not share this opinion of yours, it is quite refreshing to have a man think with his heart rather than his brain. Carson smiled, and even though this particular young woman sat right beside him, the only person he was able to visualize at all was Lizzie. Chapter 7 Lizzie cringed as the door behind her creaked when she closed it. The cool night air was precisely what she needed to divert her thoughts away from Carson's meeting with Miss Violet Saunders. The young woman's name left a bitter taste in her mouth without even saying it out loud. Just the mere thought of another woman's beady eyes gazing at Carson caused Lizzie to become angered. Even the walls of her bedchamber had begun to close in on her, hence she had escaped to the garden for relief. If there was ever a place where Lizzie could find peace and serenity, it was in her father's garden. In fact, the grounds were a space so large and vast, they spanned from Woodlock Manor onto Carson's estate. The two neighbouring estates had made use of the same gardener in order to keep the gardens in optimal opulence. The result was a delightful synergy between the two, where one flowed into the other as if they were one. The beautifully kept gardens were also the only thing that Lizzie had left of her father. A man whose footsteps had been impossible to fill, and who had left such a hole in her heart when he passed. Lizzie quietly descended the steps that led to the gardens, leading along the side of the manor house. Soon she opened the wrought iron gate that indicated the entrance. The bright moon overhead illuminated her path, even though she didn't require any guidance to navigate through the hedges and trees, the flowers and the fountains. Lizzie had spent most of her childhood running along the pathways and had memorized every inch of the space. Lizzie wandered without purpose or direction through the garden and eventually found herself wandering close to the area that connected the two estates. A smile formed on her lips as she recalled the place where Carson would climb through from his late father's estate into hers, and she approached the wall. She reached out her hand, not in the least afraid of what might be lurking inside the vines of ivy and foliage. Her fingers ran along the wall until there was a large gap. With her free hand she grasped the vines and ivy and yanked them to the side, or at least she attempted to. She yanked on the vines, but there was something that kept them from moving. Baffled by this, she gave up her plan and made her way along the wall until she reached the hedge. Only two windows were illuminated by candlelight, but neither was Carson's bedchamber. A strange feeling in the pit of her stomach surfaced as she wondered if he was still with Miss Saunders. Lizzie cringed at the thought and kept moving. As she continued to walk, putting her face up to enjoy the cool night breeze, she heard faint voices coming from the other side of the hedge. Lizzie was not planning to eavesdrop on anyone's conversation, but as she peered over, she saw something she'd feared ever since Carson had informed her of his meeting with Miss Saunders. Her stomach lurched when she saw Carson and his guest nestled cosily on a wooden bench, the same wooden bench she and Carson had spent countless afternoons seated on and conversing about life and things in general. In this instance, it seemed to be Miss Saunders who spoke, and Carson merely listened. Unfortunately for Lizzie, she could not make out what the woman spoke of, but from her disagreeable countenance, Lizzie was certain Miss Saunders was complaining of something. Anger rose inside her as Miss Saunders provocatively placed her hand on Carson's arm. 
Even worse, he allowed it. Hot tears stung her eyes and she pursed her lips. She could no longer watch any of this. And it was her own fault for being here at all. She shouldn't have ventured out, especially to this place. So she spun around and stomped back to the gate, wiping tears of anger and frustration from her cheeks. She didn't understand why she felt this way. Why would these strong feelings for Carson surface when she had always been aware he didn't reciprocate them? His nonchalance with regards to Miss Saunders' hand on his arm had infuriated her even more as she stomped along the side of the manor house, not wishing to re-enter its suffocating confines. Her chest tightened as she imagined Carson marrying Miss Saunders. More tears spilled down her cheeks. Her knees buckled from under her, and she slumped down against the wall of the manor house, sobbing softly. She placed her hand over her mouth, as she didn't wish for anyone to hear her, and she wanted to remain carefully hidden in the shadows. She allowed all her emotions to be expelled from her body. This was intolerable. She couldn't simply burst into uncontrollable sobs every time the Duke and the Duchess mentioned either Carson or Miss Saunders. Lizzie merely needed to keep herself composed, not to raise any suspicions about unrequited feelings for her neighbour and childhood friend. She drew in a few short breaths and wiped the tears from her cheeks. She hoisted herself into an upright position and proceeded to walk back to the door from which she had left. She stepped inside and made her way through the dark hallways. As she passed the Duke's study, she noticed the candle flickering inside. Lizzie stepped closer to the door and saw her brother sitting at his desk, intensely studying a book. Lizzie stood in the doorway and knocked on the door. The Duke immediately glanced up at her. Sister. What are you still doing up, James? Lizzie asked, remaining in the doorway. There are a few things that require my attention. Also, I am researching something I am not familiar with, the Duke answered. Can I be of assistance? Lizzie asked. It is rather technical, and I am fairly certain it will not be of any interest to you, he answered. Why are you still up at this hour? I couldn't sleep, Lizzie muttered, and leaned against the doorframe. And it doesn't have anything to do with the fact that Carson has a lady visiting him at his home, James asked with a knowing look. Her shoulders tightened. Does the entire world know of this? Carson spoke with me earlier, before he left. Lizzie's shoulders relaxed and she cocked her head. So it wasn't necessarily public knowledge, yet that Carson might be courting a lady. He did. Indeed. He wished to apologise for returning you home in the foxed state you were in, but he assured me that nothing untoward happened. I was already aware of that, of course. Carson is a gentleman, and he wouldn't allow any harm to come to you, nor your reputation. Carson is most certainly a proper and honourable man, one of very few left in this world, in my opinion, her brother explained. A dreamy smile formed on Lizzie's lips, and she pressed her head against the doorframe. Truer words have never been spoken. The Duke glanced at her, and his brow furrowed. I was under the impression that you would be upset over the fact that Carson is meeting with another woman. Lizzie immediately straightened her shoulders and composed herself. Why in heavens would I be upset over that piece of information? She lied. Because he is spending time with a woman who is not you, the Duke stated flatly. Lizzie giggled to hide her confusion and shook her head. I couldn't care less about what Carson does. He is free to spend his time with whomever he pleases. Her brother glanced at her apprehensively, clearly not convinced Lizzie was being truthful. Do not gaze upon me in such a manner. Truly, brother, I am not upset. Perhaps not, the Duke shrugged. Jealous, maybe. Lizzie laughed bitterly and shook her head once again. Jealous of Miss Saunders? 
please do not insult me any further. Lizzie, I have known you your entire life, and I am well aware of how you feel about Carson. It is only natural. I do not feel anything for Carson, other than friendship. You are mistaken. He is my friend, and I am very fond of him, but his choice in whom he wishes to marry is solely his own. Who spoke anything of marriage? The Duke taunted her. There is nothing wrong with being jealous, sister. I am not jealous, Lizzie uttered through gritted teeth. Not even slightly. You are the last Seymour sibling yet to marry, the Duke stated. I am well aware of that fact, James. You don't need to remind me every chance you get. I have accepted the fact that I will probably never marry and will die a lonely spinster. Why can you not do the same and just accept it? Lizzie exclaimed. The Duke stood from his chair and held his hands up in defence. There is no need to overreact, Lizzie. I apologise for teasing you when you are so clearly in pain. I am not in pain, Lizzie defended once more, but a tear defied her and ran down her cheek. James cocked his head. It seems as though you are. The only pain I am in is that of uncertainty. I am truly happy for you and her grace on the impending birth of your child, and I am happy for William that he has found love with Emma, but when will I be happy? When is it my turn to find a man who makes all these terrible feelings of loneliness and anguish disappear? Lizzie hated the desperation in her voice, but she couldn't seem to control it. Her brother slowly approached her and opened his arms to her. She didn't hesitate, but instead ran into his embrace, one of the few places she still felt safe. As her eldest brother, James had always taken care of her, ensured that she was happy and safe. He'd even held her hand while she fell asleep at night when they were younger. Lizzie had relied on him for comfort in her darkest days, and he was a hero in her eyes. The Duke had defended her when rumours had spread about her and Lord Dorset, and he had vowed that he would continue to do so for the rest of his life. Her brother was the only man she could depend on, it seemed. Not even Carson fit that bill any longer. Carson now had Miss Saunders to care for and make happy. The thought immediately made more tears stream down her face, and she sobbed in her brother's arms. Much to her surprise and relief, he began to softly murmur the lullaby he had sung to her when she was afraid to go back to sleep after a nightmare. The sound both comforted her and made her sob even more. James's heartbeat drummed against her ear, and it soothed her aching soul and broken heart. She relished this special time with her brother. The Duke had many things on his agenda, and he barely had time for himself, not to mention spending time with his wife. He was spread thinly across all his responsibilities. Lizzie didn't hold it against her oldest brother. She understood that with the title came the responsibilities as well, but she missed this closeness to him. She drew in a deep breath as the lullaby came to an end, and she pulled out of his embrace. Thank you. I truly needed to hear that. Lizzie, you are my sister, and I love you very much. I only wish for you to be happy, and if you are not, you can tell me. I love you as well, James, Lizzie expressed sincerely, and placed her palm against his cheek. I know you mean well, but there are some things you cannot fix. I can attempt to. Lizzie smiled as she lowered her hand. Always such a gallant man. The Duke shrugged nonchalantly, which made Lizzie chuckle. Perhaps I should turn in for the night. I am exhausted. Sleep well, sister. You also, James. Lizzie turned, and as she walked to the door, the Duke spoke her full name. Elizabeth. Yes. Lizzie glanced at him over her shoulder. You are welcome to stay at the estate for as long as you need to, the Duke said. Lizzie lowered her gaze for a moment before glancing back at the Duke. I would not want to impose. 
My child is blessed with a wonderful aunt in you. Having you here would mean the world to me, her brother said, sounding sincere. A smile formed on Lizzie's lips, and she nodded gratefully before leaving the study. The smile soon disappeared when she couldn't stop the tears of sadness from streaming down her cheeks once again. Chapter 8 Carson stared at the plate of food in front of him, and even though he was ravenous with hunger, he didn't have an appetite. After Miss Saunders had departed Fern Grove Manor, he had spent the rest of the evening evaluating his life, and he had decided on the choices he wished to make. He was in charge of his destiny, and he would not allow anyone to dictate to him which path he must take. The evening with Miss Saunders replayed in his mind and his jaw clenched. It had been a rather painful experience for him, not to mention how much he had despised the person Miss Saunders was. She was a young woman who was clearly used to things going her way, and if they didn't, she made it known to everyone whether they cared to listen or not. She had both bored and agitated Carson to no end. Footsteps sounded in the hallway, and the maidservant entered. Is the food not to your liking, Mr. Wallace? Carson cleared his throat and his shoulders eased slightly. It is not the food, Sophie. It is delicious, as always. I have merely lost my appetite. Something serious must be wrong, Sophie expressed, and Carson simply glanced at her. Sophie had been with the Wallace family for many years, and she seemed to know Carson well, especially when he didn't eat everything on his plate. Carson, like his father, had a larger-than-usual appetite. He'd been told by Sophie before that leaving their food untouched was a clear sign for either of the men that they had much on their mind of a serious nature. Of epic proportions, Sophie, Carson answered, and sat back for her to remove the plate from in front of him. Please do not offend Charles and Judith. Their food is always stellar. I will give your compliments to them and explain that you have weighty things on your mind. I am certain they will not be offended in the least, Sophie stated. I am available if you wish to talk about it, sir. Carson sighed heavily and ran his fingers through his hair. I do not even know where to start, Sophie. It is much too complicated for me to even arrange my thoughts in order, let alone speak of it all. Does it concern the young woman who visited last evening? Sophie inquired. If you forgive my saying so, sir, Judith thinks that woman should crawl back into the hole from which she emerged. Such a rude and uncouth young lady, with no regard for anyone but herself. Carson snorted with amusement and nodded. Indeed. As long as you do not think of marrying that horrendous woman. If you did so, I would be forced to leave, despite how much I adore you, Sophie pointed out. It was testament to how long she had been with the family, and how much Carson knew she cared for him, that he took no offence from her words. I would never do such a thing to you, Sophie. I assure you of that, Carson expressed, with confident reassurance. I will gladly choose you over her any day. That fills me with hope, Mr. Wallace, Sophie chuckled. I hear that Lord William is returning home to Woodlock Manor today. Truly, Carson asked, and Sophie nodded. Where did you hear this? From Charles. He knows everything. Clearly. Carson chuckled. I shall certainly stroll through to Woodlock Manor to welcome him home. It has been a while since I have seen Will. Perhaps you can reopen your secret entrance through the vines, Sophie hinted. What do you mean, reopen? Carson asked. His brow furrowed. As far as he was aware, the passageway through from one estate to the other should still have been open and accessible. I overheard Miss Adrienne some time ago ordering Edward to close the hole in the wall by tying the vines to the branches of the surrounding trees, Sophie answered. It completely blocks the passage. You didn't know, sir. Annoyance flared in his chest. No, 
I didn't. But thank you for telling me, Carson muttered and stood from his chair. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Wallace. I've upset you. I didn't mean to. Do not fret, Sophie. You are not in any sort of trouble. Neither is young Edward, he added, referring to the lad who assisted around the grounds of the estate. Adrienne is the only one who deserves a scolding in this instance. Carson stepped away from the table and left the parlour. He marched through the hallway and found Adrienne in the drawing room, piles of books stacked on the floor around her. All the books that were normally housed in the library had to be relocated to various rooms inside the manor house during the renovation, and since their father's collection was extensive, there were numerous rooms that were now filled with books. The stacks had become so commonplace through the house that Carson barely noticed their presence anymore. Brother, I was about to come and find you. Why did you order Edward to cover the hole in the wall between our estate and Woodlock Manor? Carson asked, interrupting his sister and shooting her a stern look. Adrienne stared at him, her mouth dropping open slightly before she cocked her head. I beg your pardon. Pardon me, sister. I was not aware that I spoke unclearly, Carson retorted, and Adrienne crossed her arms. I repeat, why did you order Edward to cover that hole in the wall? That whole unkempt section of garden has been an eyesore for a long while, and I merely thought that since we are in the process of renovating the library, we could close the hole in the wall as well. Perhaps clean up that area and repair it to the state it should be in. The estate must be in pristine condition at all times, she answered haughtily. Nonsense. You expect me to believe that it is merely a coincidence that you chose to have the passageway between estates closed on the very same day that you invited Miss Saunders to join us for dinner? Carson asked. What are you implying? Adrienne inquired, her eyes narrowing. If you require me to say it out loud, then you are not as intelligent as you think you are, sister, Carson stated. Adrienne exhaled slowly. I merely wish to eliminate any distractions that may occupy you. Lizzie is not a distraction, Carson defended, cutting to the heart of it. Of course, that's why his sister had blocked the passage. Because Adrienne wanted him to choose a partner of which she approved. And she did not approve of Lizzie. Of course she is. She has always been a distraction for you, and she likely always will. You have spent your entire life running after her with doe eyes, doing everything for her, protecting her when she does not need it. And it is not your role to do so. The woman is scandalous and does not deserve to be in your company at all. Being with her will ruin your own reputation, and eventually, brother, it will be too late. You will be tainted, and no one will have you. You think I care about what others think of me? You should. Grandfather and father spent their entire lives ensuring that the Wallace name was ranked as highly as possible, ensuring that we are well respected and well taken care of, Adrienne answered. By defiling our family, you are disrespecting father and grandfather, and I will not allow that. Carson clenched his jaw together tightly anger filling his gut. Adrienne, hold your tongue. I am not disrespectful toward father, nor anyone else in our family. I have defiled nothing. I am grateful for everything they have done, but I will not stand by and allow you to run roughshod over my life. I am a grown man, and I am free to make my own decisions, Carson pronounced firmly. Father left the estate to me, despite not being the first-born child. I can only imagine how unjust that may feel to you, but it is fact. You slinging accusations and falsehoods around about Lizzie will not change that. It just reflects badly on you, sister. Adrienne's cheeks flushed bright pink. She was clearly upset, but Carson did not back down. He loved his sister 
but when she tried to meddle in his private affairs and said untruths about Lizzie, the situation was not acceptable. This has nothing to do with the inheritance, Carson, she said eventually. It has to do with respecting the family name. Adrienne sighed. I do not care that you inherited the estate instead of me. As long as you remember that this is my home as well. I do not intend to take your home from you, sister, Carson muttered. But you do not have the authority to order Edward to do things I am not aware of. That hole in the wall is important to me. Lizzie is a part of that. I will be informing the staff that they take their orders from me, not you, from this point on. His sister's eyebrows lowered and her glare intensified. She will always make an appearance in any conversation, it seems. Lizzie, he stated, putting the emphasis on her name instead of she, will always be a part of my life, Adrienne, whether you like it or not. And while we are on the subject of women, I wish to inform you that I will not spend any more time with Miss Saunders. Carson! Enough! Were my words in any way unclear? I heard them perfectly well. I merely do not understand why you are throwing a potentially good thing away for a woman who lifts her skirt for every man she comes across. How dare you! Carson's fists clenched with rage. You will never speak of Lizzie in such a manner again. If you do, then perhaps I will rethink my position on whether you remain here at the estate or whether you move to the London townhouse instead. Adrienne's mouth fell open and she blinked a few times. But... She seemed unable to speak for a moment until finally she rallied. Why do you continue to defend that woman? Because the tales of Lizzie are untrue. Lizzie is nothing like the rumours describe her to be. Carson almost growled the words. He should not have to explain this to his sister. And how do you know this? You say this as if it is fact, with such confidence. Adrienne, I have known Lizzie for a very long time, and I know her better than anyone. Of course you do, Adrienne scoffed. Perhaps it is because you are in love with her. Carson froze for a moment. Perhaps I am, he said. But that does not change the fact that Miss Saunders is a spoiled young woman who doesn't care for anyone except herself. She is disrespectful, unkind, and I cannot marry someone with such a cruel and shallow heart. I cannot live my life with a person who cares only for material things. You, of all people, should be aware of my morals and ethics, and she defiles every single one of them. Carson's sudden yell echoed through the drawing room. His ragged breathing was the only sound that was heard afterward. Adrienne stood motionless, in stunned silence, her eyes wide and her cheeks pale. She had obviously not expected him to raise his voice in such a manner, and in truth, Carson had not expected it of himself. And yet, he did not wish to take it back. Perhaps yelling was the only manner in which Adrienne would fully understand the depth of his feelings on the matter. This was precisely why he required to take control of his life, because such things were important to him. She was much too stubborn to listen otherwise, it would seem. I will not marry Miss Saunders, and that is final. Is that understood? Carson hissed. His sister nodded quietly remaining wordless. She shook like a leaf, as if in shock at his uncharacteristic temper tantrum, but Carson didn't care. It was time she stopped trying to interfere with his life and question his choices. Good, Carson muttered, as he turned and marched out of the drawing room. He accidentally tripped over a large stack of books on his way out. The books clattered to the floor with a loud thud, but Carson continued on out the door. He had no intention of turning back now. He couldn't trust what might come out of his mouth next. He would not permit anyone to tell him how to live his life, not even his dear sister. 
Hopefully, he had made it abundantly clear that she should step down from her high horse and allow him the freedom to make his own decisions. A feeling of liberation crashed over him as he stepped outside into the sun and marched through the estate gardens directly to the wall covered in vines and ivy. He spotted Edward working in the garden and approached him. Good morning, Mr. Wallace, Edward greeted, adjusting his cap on his head. Is there something I can do for you? Indeed, Edward, Carson answered as he motioned to the wall. Please assist me in clearing those vines from the wall. All of them, Mr. Wallace, Edward asked, his tone perplexed. Indeed, Edward. Every last one of them. I would like the hole in the wall to be free from any foliage, left completely and entirely open, Carson stated. Edward shifted in discomfort and glanced briefly at the manor house. Do not fret over Miss Adrienne, Carson added. I am the master of this estate, and you will take your orders from me. Is that clear? Yes, of course, sir. Edward's eyes were wide as he stared at Carson, who suddenly realised this was the first time since he had inherited the estate that he had asserted his power as owner. It was time to stop sitting back and letting others make decisions for him. It was time to grow up at last and take control of his life. Now, he said to Edward, giving the boy a quick grin. Will you do as I've asked? Or should I call someone else to assist? Of course, Mr. Wallace. Let me fetch my shears. Carson nodded and approached the wall covered in vines and ivy, a smile forming on his lips. His gaze rose to Woodlock Manor, toward Lizzie's bedchamber window, and he wondered whether she was watching. He hoped so. He and Lizzie had a lot to talk about, as soon as he had opened up the way through. Chapter 9 A thunderously dark cloud felt like it hung over Lizzie's head as she stepped out into the sunlight of a beautifully clear fall morning. The sound of carpenters hammering from Ferngrove Manor darkened her already gloomy mood. What on earth were they doing over there? How long did it take to refurbish a library? The events of last evening were still fresh in her mind and her heart, but instead of being filled to the brim with sadness, she was now filled with something less savoury. She was in a mood that seemed to embrace pettiness, and even though she didn't want to feel that way, the thought of Carson and Miss Saunders, cavorting together in the gardens of Ferngrove Manor, filled her with rage. Still, she stood beside James and Kitty as they patiently awaited the arrival of Lord William and Lady Emma, who had returned from their travels earlier than anticipated. Her brother Will and his new wife didn't wish to miss the birth of Kitty's child. Barely a few moments passed before Lizzie began to shift her weight and a scowl weighed down her features. The hammering from the estate next door as well as a strange sound that resembled a tree being chopped down with an axe, pulsated in her head and started the beginnings of a very bad headache. What is the matter, sister? the Duke asked, obviously noticing her pained look. That infernal racket is cutting up my piece. What are they doing over at Fern Grove? Lizzie complained. Perhaps they are preparing bedchambers for Miss Saunders, the Duke answered nonchalantly. Lizzie glared at him, her left eye twitching slightly. That is not amusing, James. Please do lighten up, sister. It was only a joke. Her brother chuckled, but he stopped when he noticed that she wasn't laughing, smiling, or even letting up on her scowl. It was not a very good one, brother. I'm sorry, Lizzie. She folded her arms across her middle and didn't answer. What is going on with the two of you? the Duchess asked with a furrowed brow. James opened his mouth, about to answer his wife, but Will's coach appeared at the gates of the estate at that point, and a relieved smile formed on her brother's lips. Oh, how delightful! They are here! James stepped away from Kitty, and she raised an apprehensive brow at Lizzie. I do hope you and your brother can be civil with one another. 
He informed me last evening that he had been wrong concerning your behaviour and that you are welcome to stay with us as long as you need to. But I will not tolerate any friction between the two of you. I wish for our home to be calm. For the child. Yes, I understand, Lizzie interjected and turned away before Kitty could see the hurt in her expression. You do not need to worry. Whenever I feel the need to argue with anyone, I will lock myself in my chambers until the feeling passes. I didn't mean it in any way other than to encourage you, Lizzie, Kitty stated. I know you didn't, and I am utterly grateful that you and my brother are allowing me to stay here as long as I need to, Lizzie said, attempting her best to not sound ungrateful. The coach came to a standstill, and the next moments happened in a blur. William and Emma climbed out of the coach, and James and Kitty stepped forward to embrace the newlywed couple. All Lizzie was able to do was stand there wordlessly. It seemed as if the world slowed down around her as Emma gushed over the Duchess's swollen belly, and James and Will immediately broke into a lively discussion of adventure and travels. As a child she had often felt left out when the brothers got together and talked about things their little sister didn't understand. Those feelings of exclusion paled in comparison to now. Finally, it was her turn. Sister, Will exclaimed, approaching her with open arms. She fell into his embrace, filled with gratitude for his return. Are you well, Lizzie? Will inquired. Indeed I am. It simply feels surreal to have you back home. Lizzie grinned at him. The estate was so peaceful without you. Will's eyes sparkled with amusement, and he embraced her once more. It is not a sin for you to simply admit that you missed me. That is rather overreaching, Lizzie chuckled. And I believe congratulations are in order regarding your nuptials. Thank you, sister. Will smiled happily as Emma joined his side. Congratulations, Emma. Lizzie studied the new bride. She looked well and happy. Clearly the state of marriage agreed with Emma. Or may I be so bold as to address you as my sister? You may address me as you wish, Lizzie. Emma smiled happily and embraced Lizzie. Though sister would be wonderful. Then, sister, it is. I wish you both all the happiness in the world, Lizzie said sincerely, tears forming in her eyes. She told herself they were happy tears. Tears of joy for everyone around her who had managed to find their forever love. But the welling emotion threatened suddenly to consume her, and she released Emma and turned away, taking a few moments to steady herself and swallow down the lump in her throat. When she had herself back under control, she spoke up. Francis and the kitchen staff have prepared a delightful breakfast for us all on the terrace. And the weather is cooperating too. Shall we go? Indeed, Will nodded. I am ravenous. But in all fairness, you are always ravenous, James chuckled. I cannot argue with that, Will agreed, as they made their way to the terrace. As they seated themselves at the table overlooking the gardens, Will glanced over toward Ferngrove Manor. I wonder how Carson is doing. Perhaps we can send for him to join us. I would love to see him again after all this while. The table fell silent, and the Duke and Duchess exchanged awkward glances. Lizzie, on the other hand, pretended that she had not heard what her brother uttered, and looked down into her tea aimlessly stirring the brew. Did I say something wrong? Will asked. When it became clear that no one else planned to speak, Lizzie sighed and looked up from her tea at Will. Carson likely will be much too busy entertaining Miss Saunders to visit Woodlock Manor any longer. Her calm response surprised even herself, and she tested herself further by taking a sip of her tea, glad when her hands remained steady. Well. Will's brows had lifted high on his forehead when she glanced up at him. When did this happen? He glanced at the Duke. I was under the impression that Carson was... 
he broke off, looking awkward, until James answered. Carson only met Miss Saunders yesterday. I think Lizzie is being a tad presumptuous in her assumptions at this point, the Duke answered. Not presumptuous, only realistic, Lizzie muttered. He has only met with her once, William inquired, and the Duke nodded. That does not sound too serious. It does not matter, as Carson made it abundantly clear that he is happy with the current situation, Lizzie said. She was not quite certain whether her words were to convince everyone at the table or herself. Perhaps the more she spoke the words out loud, the more she would come to accept the reality of it. It appears to me that you are jealous, sister, Will stated bluntly, and the Duke's eyes widened slightly. William, James began, then stopped. What? Will asked. Shall we discuss something else? the Duchess said. She was watching Lizzie with concern in her gaze, while Emma's head was swivelling back and forth between them all, as if she didn't know who to look at. Lizzie felt her cheeks heat and wished to be anywhere else than at the table in this moment. Why? Will inquired and glanced at Lizzie. She had always admired his forthright manner, but right now she wanted him to be quiet. Of course, this was Will. He did not comply. You have been in love with Carson for years, he said. And now that he may have finally decided to move on with his life, you cannot bear the thought that he didn't choose you. Will! Emma stared at her husband, shocked. He seemed contrite, but only for a few seconds. That is not the case, Lizzie answered defensively. Carson can do whatever he pleases with whomever he pleases. His actions neither concern nor affect me in any manner. We are old childhood friends and nothing more. You have never been a good liar, Lizzie. Will shook his head. Lizzie wanted to punch her brother's arm, but of course she would not. Instead, hot tears stung her eyes and she stood from the table. Please excuse me. My apologies for spoiling your lovely breakfast, but I did try, she whispered, and glanced apologetically at the Duke and Duchess, before turning away and rushing inside as quickly as she could. Lizzie inwardly scolded herself for not being able to remain composed, but she should have expected no less from Will. He was much more intrusive with his words than James, and it didn't surprise her that he wished to point out the obvious even if it would result in upsetting her. She wondered if his new wife would take him to task for his bluntness. Emma, like Kitty, had been looking at her with pity in her expression as Lizzie left the table. She rushed up the staircase, her breathing ragged. As soon as she reached her rooms, she hurried into her bedchamber, slamming the door behind her. Her chest ached from holding all her emotions in as she paced around the space. She took a few deep breaths, in and out, attempting to free her heart from the pain that had started to consume it. She ran her fingers through her hair, and, despite her resolve, a sob escaped her throat. A knock on her door caused her to whirl around, and she clasped her hands together, pursing her lips. Lizzie! She recognised Will's voice through the door and drew in a deep breath. She was not certain why he still wished to torture her. Please go away, William. I only wish to speak with you, if you would allow me, Will said, his tone uncharacteristically soft and gentle. Lizzie bit her lower lip and wiped the tears from her cheeks. Very well. The door opened slowly and Will stepped into the bedchamber. I must apologise for my insensitivity, sister. I was not aware that Carson courting Miss Saunders was such an unsettling and difficult thing for you. I was teasing, though as usual, my teasing went too far. He hung his head a little, looking sheepish. Lizzie wrapped her arms around her middle. Carson courting Miss Saunders is not a difficult thing, Will, she lied, knowing he could see through her, but not knowing how else to proceed. If she admitted her distress, it would make it more real. 
I am not upset or unsettled. I am completely fine. You do not seem fine, sister. You seem broken. She turned away and dropped her gaze to the floor. It does not matter how I feel. The situation is what it is, and I will get used to it. Eventually. To her chagrin, her voice broke on the last word. Of course it matters, Lizzie. You are losing Carson, who was a very large part of your life for such a long time. It is only natural to feel a sense of loss and be envious toward Miss Saunders, Will said, as he slowly approached her. It is a natural emotion to feel. I can't imagine how I'd feel if Emma began to see someone else. Lizzie almost smiled at that ridiculous notion. That would never happen, brother. Everyone can see how much in love you are with each other. It is the same for James and Kitty. I am so very happy for you all, you know. I know. We all do. Lizzie shook her head. But I am utterly certain that Carson is making the worst mistake of his life if he marries her. But it is not my place to imply that, Will. I have no place there now, at all, if he chooses Miss Saunders for his future. And you still say it doesn't matter? I would suggest that you are in love with the man, Lizzie. It does not matter whether I am or am not, Will. My feelings for him do not matter if he does not reciprocate them. He has had so many chances to declare himself, but he has not. Clearly he does not have those type of feelings for me, and unfortunately, I do not know what to do with mine, Lizzie admitted. I am truly sorry, sister. I had always imagined you and Carson together, or that you would find your way to one another eventually. Will's words almost broke her, and she had to focus hard to swallow the sob that rose. Clearly it is not in the cards for us. The only thing that I am certain of is that Miss Violet Saunders is not right for him, but it is not my place to say a word. A tear ran down her cheek. I do wish for him to be happy, even if it isn't with me. Your intent is pure, my dear sister but sometimes you need to follow your own heart. Your own happiness is important as well. Lizzie sighed and nodded. I am aware. I simply need to find something real that makes me happy, truly happy, and not simply chase the mere idea of happiness. You will find it when you least expect it, Will said with a smile. I never imagined that I could ever be as happy as I am now, and I wish the same for you. You make that terrible cliché worth waiting for, Lizzie whispered, and wiped another tear from her cheek. Will you rejoin us for breakfast? Perhaps it would be better if I didn't. I will catch up with all of you later today. I wish to have a few moments to myself. I may even disappear into the library for a while. I require a bit of distraction, and I know you wish to see Carson. I do not want to be here and available when you do. I understand, sister. And I am truly sorry for upsetting you. I should be used to it by now, Lizzie jokingly said, before they both laughed. It is never my intention to hurt you. You should never forget that, Will stated, his eyes fixed on her. And now I have both you and Emma to pull me up when I go too far. I love you very much, Will. And I you, dear Lizzie. She smiled as Will quietly left her bedchamber, closing the door behind him. He was the most annoying brother ever, but she loved him dearly. She loved both her brothers very much. She pulled in a few breaths and slowly approached the window. She drew back the curtains and glanced down in the direction of Fern Grove Manor, despite every cell in her body advising her not to. Shock made her heart jump at the sight of Carson and Edward the gardener toiling hard and removing the vines and ivy from the wall between the estates. The hole in the wall that had been their secret passageway between Ferngrove and Woodlock for so many years was now exposed and open once more. Their secret passage was clearly no longer a secret, 
and for a moment a glimmer of hope flickered inside Lizzie's heart. Chapter 10 Nothing could prevent Carson from embracing his good friend, Will. It had been far too long since they had spent time together in each other's company, and he'd been delighted to receive the invitation to visit. He'd missed his friend, since Will had climbed aboard the train to Edinburgh to follow Lady Emma in the pursuit of his heart. He had found it admirable that Will had placed so much on the line and sacrificed as much as he had while leaving everything behind. Just so that he could be beside Emma as she had journeyed to Scotland. Despite not being able to attend their wedding ceremony, as it was on a ship in the middle of the North Sea on its way to a port in Denmark, Carson was truly happy for his best friend. Tell me all about your travels. It must have been fascinating. Carson beamed, as the two men sat comfortably on the terrace of Woodlock Manor, the cool breeze skimming the grass behind them. Or did you spend all the while staring at Lady Emma and miss the magnificent sights around you? She is the most magnificent sight in the world. Will chuckled and shook his head. Travelling with her was a wonderful experience. The places we visited were breathtaking. Denmark enchanted us both. We didn't stay there long, a fortnight at most. Emma was worried about Kitty. She didn't wish to miss the birth, and she had promised the Duchess she would not. How is her grace? Discomfort is evident on her face, and the manner in which she walks. She is rather breathless at times. But despite all these things, she says she is well. The doctor is happy with her progress, and soon there will be another addition to the Seymour family, Will answered. And you and your new wife, Carson asked. We have not spoken of children yet, but I have no objection to the matter. I love her, and I will wait for whenever she is ready. And if she never is, that will be all right with me too. I love her, and I certainly do not wish to force her into something for which she is not ready. She is young. We both are, and we have the rest of our lives together. There is no rush, says the man who married on a ship without even inviting his best friend, Carson pointed out in a mocking tone. My sincerest apologies, Will chuckled. And you, Carson, how is your courtship with Miss Saunders? You heard of that already, Carson asked, surprised. He shifted uncomfortably in his seat. Indeed. I was informed of it yesterday at the breakfast table, Will answered. You should not believe everything you hear, Carson said, annoyed that a single dinner with a stranger had escalated so quickly. I would hardly call one dinner a courtship. It is not true, then, Will inquired. Adrienne arranged the meeting with Miss Saunders. She was under the impression that we would be a good match, Carson said. He couldn't help his brows coming down into a frown at the thought of anyone wanting him to end up with someone like Miss Violet Saunders. Was your sister wrong? Indeed, yes. Carson stared out at the garden and sighed. I do not wish to marry that woman. She infuriated me the entire dinner talking only about herself. I cannot even begin to imagine what an entire life with her would be like. He shuddered. So, when is the wedding? Will grinned with amusement. Do not speak such absurdities, even in jest, friend. Carson huffed out a breath. I understand that Adrienne means well. She wishes for me to be happy but she also wants to ensure that the Wallace family name doesn't get thrown to the dogs and dragged through the mud. Any more than it already has, Will chuckled. I am serious, William, Carson choked. She means well, but I cannot allow her to make these decisions for me. I am the man of the house, and she does not respect that. Have you informed her of your feelings? Indeed. Carson nodded. And? 
Carson didn't want to offend his friend with what Adrienne thought about Lizzie, but there had always been truth between him and Will, and so he spoke candidly in response. She accused me of being in love with Lizzie, and said if I spent any more time with your sister, then I would tarnish the family name and everything my father and grandfather had sacrificed to ensure we remain respected among our peers, Carson answered. Well? Will blinked a few times, clearly nonplussed. I had always suspected that your sister was daft, especially since she began volunteering at the hospital and seemed to take joy in being around sick and diseased people, but this now confirms it. Will's jaw clenched. She is right about one thing, though. About what? Carson asked. He let the dig about Adrienne slide for now, as technically his family had just insulted Lizzie moments earlier. About you being in love with my sister. Carson's heart skipped a beat. Will knew. He lifted his chin, but could not deny the truth. Yes, I am. Why do you not tell her? Will asked. If you were me, would you tell her? Carson asked. I have nothing to offer her. No title. She is a duke's daughter. She will find someone far more suitable than I to marry. If it were me, then of course I would tell the lady how I felt, Will said. It sounded like a challenge thrown out between them. Now you are the one who is daft, Carson muttered. He leaned back against the backrest of the chair. Where is your sister, by the way? Usually she prances around the garden, soaking in the last bit of sunshine before the winter sets in. Will cocked his head and smirked. You are not even aware of how lovelorn you sound, are you? I am not discussing this with you any longer, Carson muttered, and stood from the table. Can you direct me to where I can find your sister, please? She's in the library, but I do not suggest that you go there today. And why not? She may hurl a book at your head. Carson gaped at his friend. And why would she do such a thing? Because she has been in a hostile and angry mood since she found out about your meeting with Miss Saunders, Will answered in a seemingly nonchalant manner. He shrugged. Or perhaps it is something else that upset her. My sister remains a mystery. You, of all people, should be aware of this. Carson's jaw clenched. I shall not be long. If you have not returned by sunset, I will assume my sister clocked you with a book, and you are dearly departed. Carson narrowed his eyes. But rather than give Will the satisfaction of seeing him react further, he simply nodded at his friend and left the terrace. Will was well known for being a jokester, but Carson wasn't certain if he was serious with regards to Lizzie this time. He was unsure why she would be so angry, but perhaps if he asked, she would tell him. Carson stopped in front of the doors of the library and hesitated for a moment, Will's warning swirling in his head. She wouldn't really throw a book at him, surely. She had too much respect for books to do that. Still, he was not certain why, but he felt the need to practice extreme caution in this meeting. As he opened the door, the library was quiet. He slowly walked along the length of the large room. Where was Lizzie? What are you doing here? He suddenly heard her voice echo through the space and whirled around to see her straightening up from behind one of the couches. It looked as if she were picking up a book from the floor. She stood straight, facing him, and tucked the thick book in her hands in front of her bosom. I was visiting with Will, and I hoped to get the chance to speak with you for a moment, too, Carson answered, and carefully approached. She took a tiny step backward, and he stopped. Although your brother advised me not to, Carson admitted. Will said you were in a bit of a mood. Bad enough to possibly even hurl a book at my head. Oh, is that what he said? 
Lizzie snapped shut her mouth after those words, though her eyes flashed with some kind of emotion he couldn't read. Indeed, Carson answered, eyeing her red cheeks and clenched hands on the book's edges. Why are you so angry, my lady? I am not angered by anything, or any one for that matter, Lizzie answered, and turned away from him. That is a lie. I can see that you're upset. Being untruthful was unusual for Lizzie. She wore her heart on her sleeve and didn't usually hide her feelings from anyone. Especially not from him. He had known her forever, and she knew that he would pick up on it if she were lying. Which made today's situation more perplexing. Lizzie, I am not certain exactly what is the matter, but if you can merely tell me. I do not see the point in doing such a thing, Mr. Wallace. Mr. Wallace? Since when? He ran his hands through his hair, exasperated. Could you please refrain from this formality, Lizzie, and talk with me? You and I have always been able to speak to one another openly. Why can you not tell me what is the matter now? You will not understand, Lizzie stated simply. Should you not leave that decision up to me? Carson inquired. Lizzie shook her head. I do not wish to speak about this any longer, and I certainly do not wish to keep you from things, or people, who are more important to you. People? Lizzie, is this about Miss Saunders? Carson stepped closer. Lizzie whirled to face him, her eyes flashing with something that seemed akin to hurt. Don't utter that woman's name in my presence. That certainly confirms my suspicions. You promised me that you were not upset with me meeting with Miss Saunders, Carson pointed out. I am well aware of what I said, Carson, and I am not upset over that. I wish you all the happiness in the world, Lizzie muttered. Somehow, I suspect you do not mean that. Lizzie opened her mouth to speak but hesitated. Carson could clearly see that whatever was weighing heavily on her mind, she didn't wish to say it. Tell me what is in your heart, Lizzie. Please. I beg you. I cannot, as my words would be cruel, and you do not deserve anything but kindness. Lizzie, please. Carson, perhaps you should leave. I do not wish to hurl a book at your head. Her smile was sad. Carson nodded slowly. Now was not the time to pursue the matter any further. Lizzie clearly was too upset. Perhaps one day you will understand why I came here this afternoon to speak with you. It was never my intention to have a wedge placed between us by any other woman. It is not merely any other woman. Of all the young ladies in Somerset, why did Adrienne insist on introducing you to Miss Saunders? Have you asked her this question? Of course you didn't, because you are a man. And you are kind and genuine. Men like yourself, Carson, do not think about how manipulative women can be. Women often do things and say things for a specific reason, not simply because they are emotional or in a mood. Then what is the specific reason you are pushing me away? Are you afraid to lose me if I marry Miss Saunders? Carson inquired. Not in the least, Carson, as I cannot lose something I never had to begin with, Lizzie said. She turned away, and Carson admitted defeat in his mind. For today, at least. Tomorrow was a whole other story. I could say precisely the same thing, Carson muttered, before he turned on his heel and stomped out of the library. He had never truly understood women, how their minds worked or how they were ruled by their emotions. But he thought he had understood Lizzie. Now he wasn't so sure. It was obvious to him that all women were not to be fully understood, and Lizzie was now living proof of that. She had not given him a clear answer as to why she was upset and seemed to be trying to keep him at a distance. He could make a guess, of course 
but he wasn't sure that would be good for either of them. Chapter 11 Lizzie stretched her legs beneath her as she turned the page of the book she was reading, beams of sunlight shining through her window and warming her. She was comfortably nestled on a large pillow on the floor, quietly enjoying the peace, desperate to forget about her troubles with Carson. She had not seen nor heard from him in over a week. And despite her heart being shattered into a million tiny shards on that day in the library when he had turned tail and walked out, she'd convinced herself that it was for the best. She wouldn't be doing herself any favours if she kept dwelling on the past and things she'd once wished for. It was time to put the past behind her and focus on a future without Carson. She had to move on with her life and forget about the man who had stolen her heart over the many years she had known him. Maybe she should do what Emma had done and go off on a journey abroad to discover herself. Perhaps she would meet a charming man who spoke with an accent. A man who'd know nothing of the rumours of Somerset. A man who would know only the real her and not judge her via rumours and gossip. She could even change her name to something else and turn over a new leaf. The notion was strangely appealing. A soft knock on the door broke her concentration and she glanced up from her book. Who is it? It's us. Kitty and Emma. Lizzie pouted as she retrieved a pressed wildflower, given to her by her father before he passed, and used it as a bookmark. She closed the book and placed it down beside her. All right. Come in, sisters. Emma and Kitty appeared in the doorway with hopeful smiles, and Lizzie immediately knew something was brewing between them. Her heart sank but also sang at the same time. They cared for her, genuinely, and for the first time in a long time she felt like she was a true part of the Seymour family. Your Grace, my lady, Lizzie greeted them formally. How can I assist you? Is something the matter? Indeed, Emma said. I have only been here at the estate for a week, and I already feel as though the walls are closing in on me. I need your help, Lizzie. I certainly am familiar with that feeling, Lizzie mumbled. But how can I help you? Kitty and I would like to invite you to accompany us to the tea room this afternoon, Lady Emma said, with a smile and fluttering lashes. Please agree to join us. We need a ladies' day out, and it would not be the same without you. A tea room visit. I apologise. But that doesn't sound like something I am currently in the mind to enjoy, Lizzie answered. But you are most encouraged to have a lovely time without me. But you must join us, Lizzie. It would be a good thing for you to interact with other women once more. By now, all the rumours about you have been put to rest, and no one gives a fig about it. Indeed, Kitty uttered in agreement. They are all too busy gossiping about Lady Augustine, who had an affair with Lord Franklin. Lizzie's mouth dropped open. A married man, she gasped. Then she realised quickly that she had fallen for the bait that Lady Emma and the Duchess had so deviously laid out for her. Emma and Kitty grinned with satisfaction. Please join us, Emma said. It will be a delightful afternoon. Lizzie bit her bottom lip and nodded slowly. Very well, but I do not wish to hear a single word about Carson or Miss Saunders. Who? Emma asked, with mock confusion. The three women giggled, which lightened Lizzie's heart. Within the hour, Lizzie, Emma and Kitty were dressed in their best day dresses and on their way into town. The coach travelled slowly along the road toward the tea room, and a strange feeling filled the pit of Lizzie's stomach. She hadn't gone to the tea room for a very long while, even before her intoxicated evening at Lord and Lady Wheeling's ball. Once the terrible rumours concerning her and Lord Dorset began to circulate, she had withdrawn from most social events. Unfortunately, many of her true friends had shown their colours over the past months. And although she was grateful to know the truth about them, 
it still hurt, nonetheless. However, she was feeling anxious about being in those same women's presence once again. She'd be forced to pretend that nothing was the matter and that she had been unaffected by what had happened. Emma and Kitty attempted to casually converse in the coach, hoping to make Lizzie feel at ease, but the atmosphere was still strained. As soon as the coach came to a halt, Lizzie's heart began to pound in her chest, her body frozen. Are you all right, Lizzie? Emma inquired, reaching her hand out to Lizzie. She drew in a breath and nodded. I am perfectly fine. You need not worry about me. I can take care of myself. I agree. We are all tougher than the world thinks we are, Kitty stated, and reached for her other hand. With her hands clasped by the two women, Lizzie's heart lightened. She might feel lonely whenever she thought of Carson, but with Emma and Kitty by her side, she would never be truly alone. They released hands after a long moment, and then the three women climbed out of the coach and made their way across the street toward the tea room. The bright green paint on the door frame and the window frames was inviting, and it still appeared to look the same as the last time Lizzie had visited. As they stepped inside, Emma placed a reassuring hand on Lizzie's arm, which Lizzie appreciated more than she was able to express in words. Who knew what she would find on the inside? Stares, whispers, or would some of the other customers simply turn away when they saw her? They entered the large room with tables scattered strategically around. Women of all ages chattered happily, sipping their tea and nibbling on cakes, fruits and pastries. Lizzie exhaled slowly. It all looked very normal. She hadn't realised she'd been holding her breath for so long. She felt light-headed. Then the ladies in the room began to notice Lizzie's presence, and their voices did indeed lower into the whispers that she despised. The humming sound of the whispers intensified, but it had no effect on Emma or Kitty, who sauntered as if uncaring to an open table which had been reserved for them. It was certainly one of the benefits of being part of the Seymour family. Lizzie followed their lead and fixed an uncaring look on her own face. Once seated at the table, the proprietress of the tea room, Miss Abigail Roslin, approached. Good afternoon, Your Grace, my ladies. How are you all this wonderful afternoon? Simply marvellous, although the journey here has made us quite parched, the Duchess answered. The usual? Yes, thank you. Miss Roslyn nodded and hurried away from the table as hastily as she had approached it. Your Grace and my lady, Lizzie said with a smile. I do apologise for being rather withdrawn the past week. I had a few personal issues that took my attention. I didn't mean to be rude or not spend time with you both. But I am glad you convinced me to join you today. It is quite lovely to be out and to be here with you both. Thank you. Indeed. Kitty grinned. They do serve the most scrumptious cakes. She placed her hand on her swollen stomach. At least the child will be happy and well fed. Lizzie and Emma chuckled in unison at Kitty's words. Miss Rosalind and a maidservant approached, then placed large plates of delicious baked treats in the centre of the table. The maidservant quietly poured the tea and once again moved away to leave the three ladies in peace. Lizzie sipped her tea and sighed softly. That certainly is delicious. What blend is that? I am not certain, Emma said. Miss Roslyn creates her own special blends in a blending room behind the tea room. This particular blend is utterly delicious, and I have inquired quite a few times but she refuses to give away her secret formula. Emma shrugged. Rightfully so. It is her hard work and her creation. She cannot simply give it to just anyone, Kitty said. They continued to speak of delightful things, Emma's wedding on the ship on its course to Denmark, the progress of Kitty's child's nursery, and although Lizzie only spoke sporadically, she truly enjoyed being in their company. Then the whispers started once more, and when she heard a high-pitched giggle, the hairs on the back of her neck rose. 
Lizzie would recognise that laugh anywhere. She drew in a deep breath and allowed her gaze to shift to her left, her eyes narrowing as she stared into the dark, beady eyes of Miss Violet Saunders. Miss Saunders glared at her before turning back to the young lady who sat beside her. Lizzie immediately heard her name being mentioned, and then titters of laughter, and her jaw clenched. Ignore her. She is annoying and does not deserve any reaction from you, the Duchess stated. Lizzie nodded and turned away from the sight of Miss Saunders, but even for a while afterward, she still heard her name whispers half directed her way. With every passing moment, Lizzie's agitation grew. Perhaps it was not such a good idea to come here, she muttered. Nonsense, Emma said. She doesn't own the tea room, or the town for that matter. She does, however, seem to have the entire town wrapped around her finger for some inexplicable reason, Lizzie muttered. Emma scoffed, but then raised a brow as her gaze shifted to her right. Good afternoon, Your Grace, my lady. Miss Saunders' piercing voice at their table caused Lizzie to cringe. And the town whore? I beg your pardon, Lizzie exclaimed and stood from her chair. So too did Emma and Kitty, the latter taking longer due to her pregnant condition. How dare you address my dear sister-in-law in such a manner, Kitty said when she was standing. She stared at Miss Saunders with a disbelieving gaze. I only say what everyone already knows. You cannot be serious. Emma's cheeks were red. I do not believe I spoke unclearly in any manner, Miss Saunders said, her nose stuck in the air. You are rather brave to think that it is appropriate for you to come here. This is a civilised place for ladies of class. If that's so, what are you doing here? Lizzie snapped. Miss Saunders laughed, pretending to be amused, but her eyes flashed with hatred. You are utterly amusing. But it doesn't surprise me that you are the joke of Somerset. No one wishes to have you anywhere near them, and I don't blame them in the least. Wives are afraid that you will cast your claws into their husbands, and mothers are hiding their sons as a result of your despicable behaviour. I beg your pardon, Emma interjected, but you cannot speak to Lizzie in such a manner. Need I remind you that I am the daughter of the chief magistrate, and if you speak to me once more with such disrespect, then you will leave me no choice but to inform my father, Miss Saunders hissed. Emma, known for never backing away from a fight, stepped close to the young woman and glared right in her face. Lizzie loved her for her ferocity. And what could your father possibly do to me? Arrest me? That would be based on false claims, and he could most certainly lose his position as chief magistrate, the Duchess pointed out in a cold tone. Miss Saunders narrowed her eyes and muttered, Is that a threat, Your Grace? It is a fact. We are only returning the courtesy you bestowed onto us, Emma answered and cocked her head. And need I remind you that bad-mouthing is not an attractive trait for a woman to have. No man likes a bitter and twisted bad-mouth. We would not wish for you to grow old alone, would we? You know nothing of me. And we shall keep it that way. Emma nodded with satisfaction. Suit yourself. Enjoy the company of that whore, Miss Saunders simpered. Emma grabbed Miss Saunders by the sleeve of her dress and the young woman shrieked. Allow me to make something absolutely clear. Lizzie is not a whore, and if you continue to spread lies about her, you will live to regret it, Violet Saunders. Miss Saunders' eyes widened and she pursed her lips. And that applies to all of you, Kitty announced, claiming the attention of the entire group of women in the tea room. Have any of you heard of the law of libel? It is an offence to knowingly spread lies. Ask your husbands, if you dare. I am the Duchess of Somerset, and I will not tolerate my dear sister being treated this way. Lizzie is many things, but she is not a light-skirted woman. 
She does carry the scarlet letter on her breast, and she need not be judged by any of you for that, as I am well aware of what many of you ladies do when you think the world is not watching. I see you all. Everyone gaped at Kitty, including Lizzie, who barely recognised her timid sister-in-law. Kitty continued. Lizzie is a good person, and anyone who conjures a story purely for sensation will have to deal with me. I will not allow the destruction of her reputation at the hands of hypocritical people. The silence inside the tea room was deafening, and tension hung thickly in the air. Is that clear? Emma said firmly, and a sea of faces nodded in unison. Miss Saunders backed away, like a scared little rabbit. Lizzie dropped back into her seat, her legs too shaky to hold her up, and her heart pounding in her chest. She'd never asked the Duchess or Lady Emma to defend her so ferociously, but it meant the world to her that they had done it. And so openly. Right, Lady Emma muttered, and turned to Lizzie and the Duchess with a grim smile. Shall we return home to the estate? Chapter 12 Carson was convinced he would never be able to fully understand how female logic worked. Trying to do so would only be a waste of energy and effort. Women were the ultimate mysteries of the world, and men who claimed to understand them were most certainly delusional. He tapped his fingers on the leather armrest of his favourite chair, staring out in front of him. The estate had been quiet for once, much to Carson's delight, and he relished the silence, attempting to quiet the muddle inside his mind. Lizzie's behaviour and words puzzled him, and he didn't fully understand why on earth she was upset with him. He understood that she didn't wish for him to marry Miss Saunders, she was obviously convinced that they were not a good match. Carson agreed with Lizzie on that front, of course. He couldn't imagine living with a woman like that young harpy for the rest of his life. Carson ran his fingers through his hair, and as he sat back in his chair, the door of his study burst open. His entire body jolted, and he glanced at Adrienne, who stood in the doorway. Her face was crimson, and her wild hair added to her enraged state. What on earth is the matter with you? Carson inquired preparing himself for a theatrical performance starring none other than his sister. I had such a lovely and delightful day at the hospital. Mr. Barrington was released this afternoon. He has made a miraculous full recovery from the fever. Adrienne didn't sound pleased. Instead, her voice was clipped and impatient. As if she had something to share and was going through the motions of polite small talk beforehand. That is wonderful. Congratulations to him, Carson muttered, not in the least interested in her tale. Thank you, brother. Dr. Richards was very pleased, although I had assured him from the start that the hospital would benefit from having me there. Adrienne smiled, but it almost looked like a grimace. As I left the hospital, I strolled across the road and entered the apothecary. Miss Georgia was there, and she told me of a rather dramatic event that happened in the tea room today. I even heard it from numerous people as I made my way back to the estate. In fact, it was all anyone could talk about. I hardly think that a piece of town gossip is something I should concern myself with, Carson scoffed. Ah, but it involves Miss Saunders. She was verbally attacked in the most dreadful fashion by William's new wife and the Duchess of Somerset. What? Carson gasped. Why? Some say she made a snarky remark about Elizabeth, who happened to be with them. They say dear Violet threatened Lady Emma with her father's position, and some say that she was entirely innocent in the matter, Adrienne stated. I hardly think the latter is the case. That woman has no tact and no discretion either. She will say anything necessary to ensure that she humiliates everyone who crosses her. Did her ladyship slap her? I hope so, Carson said. Slap? 
Adrienne's jaw dropped. Of course not. She was clearly taken aback by her brother's lack of sympathy for the treatment of Miss Saunders, and she crossed her arms. That is no manner in which to be supportive of your betrothed. I beg your pardon, Carson exclaimed, shock pulsing through his system. That woman is not my betrothed. I didn't agree to any such thing. In fact, he declared quite the opposite. Miss Violet is extremely excited about the upcoming nuptials. She even sent me a letter to personally thank me for introducing her to you. His sister beamed. Did you not hear me, Adrienne? I will not marry that woman. I informed you of that from the start, and nothing has changed. Carson stood from his chair. Why do you insist on this farce? Because she is a good fit for you, brother. No, because in your eyes, she is a better fit than the one whom I wish to marry, Carson snarled. I cannot believe you have tried to orchestrate this without my knowledge. I did what I had to do. For our family, his sister insisted. You are utterly ridiculous, Adrienne. You relish in my pain and woe, just as Miss Saunders does for poor Lizzie. You deserve one another. Perhaps you and Miss Saunders can marry. I am certain you will be very miserable together, Carson answered, and rushed past her to the door. He had to get out into air that was fresh and clean, not tainted with his sister's ridiculous notions. I already made the announcement, Carson. Carson whirled. You did what? I didn't think you were serious when you told me that you didn't wish to marry her, she said. Why would I joke about something as serious as that? You know how I feel about arrangements and loveless marriages. It is pointless, unnecessary, and creates more heartache and unhappiness than anything else. I don't wish to be a part of something like that. Knowingly marrying someone whom you do not care for, or cannot stand for that matter, you're doomed from the start. I refuse. Mother and father didn't have an arranged marriage. Did you know that? his sister asked suddenly. Carson narrowed his eyes. She rushed on. That's right. They met, they fell hopelessly in love with one another, and they married. The entire city of Somerset was besotted with their tale of love, as they were under the impression that they fell in love after their arrangement had been made by their parents. But it was not true. They only made it seem that way to preserve the relationship between their families. That was how we attained our authority, our power and our wealth. Mother's family, Carson muttered. Indeed. Her father is the late King George of Wales, and she was a princess. Carson stood silently for a moment, allowing the revelation to fully sink in. Tears formed in his eyes. How are you aware of this, and I am not? I was not aware of it until a few years after Mother left. I came across documents in Father's study. He kept a journal and wrote in it often. He wrote about the Welsh princess who broke his heart. I also found a document that stated the same, Adrienne explained. Carson shook his head. Mother loved Father, but still she left him. How does someone fall out of love with someone whom they had married and had a family with? Did we not mean anything to her? Adrienne touched his arm gently. Carson, you must understand that Mother loved us both with her entire heart, and we meant everything to her. And you know this how? From a few letters. Then why did she leave? It doesn't make sense, Carson said, his heart tightening in his chest. Her parents wished for her to join them in Aberystwyth, as her father was terribly ill on the brink of death. Her father had written a letter to say that since she was the only living heir to the throne, she would be required to move back to Aberystwyth. 
Mother and father had a rather heated and exhausting argument, as father didn't wish for her to leave or accept her lineage. He told her that if she left, she should not bother coming home again. She felt that she had no choice but to leave. Her father needed her there, and it was her duty, Adrienne explained. Carson's brow furrowed. And the rumours of her and Lord Fitzgerald? Rumours. That was all they were, and all they will ever be. Mother loved father, and she loved us, but she also did what was necessary for her family, and for the crown, Adrienne answered, her gaze lingering on his. Carson ran his fingers through his hair. The ambiguity was not lost on him, and he nodded. So it was not father who sacrificed for us, but mother. Indeed. She gave up her entire life in order for us to live a normal one. She didn't wish to disrupt us, and when she was needed in Aberystwyth, she gave up everything she loved, including father and us. She did love us, Carson. A tear ran down Carson's cheek and he lowered his gaze. Adrienne placed her hand against his chest. My dearest brother, I understand that Miss Saunders is not the woman with whom you wish to spend the rest of your life, but please remember what Mother did for us. Carson glanced at his sister and nodded slowly. You should perhaps speak to Lizzie. We would certainly not wish for her to ruin your prospects, Adrienne said softly. What do you mean by that? Carson asked, and stepped away from his sister. She was also at the tea room, apparently bad-mouthing Miss Saunders as well. At least she didn't threaten dear Violet, like her sisters-in-law, or so I heard. Miss Adrienne shrugged. Carson narrowed his eyes and his jaw clenched. I am certain she didn't. She would never. Adrienne rolled her eyes. Oh, please, do not be so naive. It would not be the first time she displayed erratic and inappropriate behaviour. Adrienne, you don't know what you speak of, Carson muttered. A sudden revelation washed over him. Of course. What? It is not important, Carson fobbed her off, not willing to share what had just occurred to him. Did Miss Saunders harm Lizzie in any way? You care more for Lizzie's safety than your betrothed. She is not my betrothed except in your mind. I had nothing to do with that decision, Carson muttered. I must go see if Lizzie is all right. Carson, do not dare. Or what? Carson growled at her. You are the reason Miss Saunders came into our lives, so this is your doing, not mine. Lizzie is a grown woman. She can fend for herself, Adrienne muttered and crossed her arms. That is not the point, Adrienne. Lizzie was there for me when I felt the loneliest in my life. She was there for me when I needed someone. Her mere presence provided me with the comfort and understanding I required at that time. Lizzie has never disappointed me, and it is only fair that I defend her, when she is being scrutinized and gossiped about. She is my best friend, and she has never hurt me. Or lied to me. Unlike you. I didn't lie to you, Carson. I was merely protecting you, as a sister should, Adrienne defended. No. You twist the truth to appease yourself and make it fit what you wanted for your own life and mine. I will no longer allow you to manipulate me, Carson answered, and turned away from his older sister. Think of mother and father, Carson. He glared at his sister, his pulse pounding in his throat. If they had dared to tell me the truth, perhaps I would. But they do not deserve my consideration at this point, Carson said, before storming out of the study, leaving Adrienne behind. Chapter 13 The journey back to Woodlock Manor from the tea room seemed to last a lifetime. The silence was deafening. 
Neither Lady Emma nor the Duchess spoke a single word in the coach. Lizzie practically held her breath the entire time, awaiting any response from her new sisters. She had certainly not expected either of the two ladies to defend her in the manner that Emma and Kitty had, and her gratitude spilled over. Only now, she worried that their support of her would affect their standing in society too. Lizzie glanced at Kitty, who gave her an encouraging smile. It reassured her slightly. Upon their arrival at home, they discovered that James and Will had planned their own excursion for the afternoon, and the Duchess requested that Francis and the maids prepare a delicious late afternoon repast for the ladies in the parlour. Emma suddenly and completely out of nowhere began to giggle, and within a few moments the sound had evolved into peals of amused laughter. Is everything all right, Emma? Lizzie inquired, wondering if her new sister had lost her sanity. I am perfectly fine. Emma chuckled and wiped a tear from under her eye. I simply cannot believe that woman threatened us with her father's position. Please, that man would not know his left hand from his right. Lizzie cocked her head, suppressing a smile. Precisely, Kitty said. Violet Saunders is a spoiled, foolish woman. She is oblivious to the ways of the world and is under the impression that her father's stature and position in the courts is a valid reason to treat people in any manner in which she wishes. But as soon as she is treated similarly in return, then it is an atrocity. Emma laughed and turned to Lizzie. You should certainly not fret over her. She is as insignificant as a waft of grass blowing in the wind. Wafts of grass disperse seeds into the air, allowing for... Lizzie trailed off as she studied Kitty and Emma's kind expressions. She cleared her throat and nodded. I apologise. I understand what you meant, and I cannot tell you how grateful I am for your support today, sisters. I am lucky to have you both in my life. As we are to have you, my dear Lizzie, Emma said. Are you really fine, though, Lizzie? Kitty inquired. This cannot be easy for you at all. You and Carson have always been so very close. We were close, Lizzie corrected. A silence fell over the parlour. Lizzie released a sigh. My brothers are convinced that I am jealous of Miss Saunders because she is being courted by Carson. Are you? the Duchess asked. It is not a simple yes or no answer, Lizzie admitted. I want Carson to be happy, of course, as he deserves a wonderful life, but not with her. She is not the right woman for him. He merits someone so much nicer than that. I wish he would realise she is an unkind woman who will not love him in the manner in which he deserves. That certainly is not jealousy, Lizzie. It sounds more as though you are wanting the best for Carson and perhaps in mourning for the relationship you had with him, and that will inevitably change moving forward, the Duchess pointed out. It feels that way, although I am not certain why, Lizzie admitted. I have spent countless hours attempting to determine why I feel so melancholy. It feels as though I have lost the only person who understands me better than I understand myself. He had the ability to see through my forced smiles and my pretend indifference. He noticed the smallest indicators if ever I was not happy. He could dry my tears before they even welled in my eyes. As if to emphasise her point, a stray tear ran down her cheek. She didn't attempt to wipe it away. You love him. Truly love him. Kitty's words were tender and Lizzie nodded slowly. Very much so, Lizzie whispered. But it is too late now. He is betrothed to Miss Saunders. It is not too late, Lizzie, Emma assured her. Perhaps you should speak with Carson and tell him of your feelings for him. I cannot do that. I would seem petty and desperate, and if he has already made his decision, then it would be cruel to do such a thing to him. I've had many opportunities to make my feelings known to him, 
but I didn't follow through. I've recited the words in my mind so many times I've lost count. I know precisely what I would say, but now I can never say them to his face. I am a coward, on the verge of losing the only man I've ever loved, but I have left things too late. All is not lost, Lizzie, Emma said again. I am afraid it is. He came to speak with me last week, and I almost hurled a book at him. He left in quite a temper. If it's any consolation, Lizzie, I basically did the same to Will, Emma pointed out. And we certainly are aware of what happened after that, the Duchess retorted. Lizzie rolled her shoulders to release tension. Please, I still cannot enter the study without an awkward feeling in my stomach. The Duchess chuckled and placed her hand over her swollen belly. I know about awkward feelings in the stomach. Are you all right? Emma and Lizzie inquired, almost at the same time. I am perfectly fine. The child simply lies in a very uncomfortable position. For me, not for him, the Duchess assured them both. Him? Emma smiled. You believe it's a boy? Fantastic. Another Seymour man to deal with, Lizzie muttered, but she grinned at Kitty. The Duchess chuckled and shook her head. Perhaps. I am not quite certain yet. It does feel right to refer to the child as a boy, but I cannot say for sure. As long as he or she is of sound health, I don't mind. Have you thought of names? Lizzie asked thankful that the conversation had taken a turn and removed her from the centre pedestal. James and I have discussed it at length, but we have not come to any decision yet. But I promise, you two will be the first to know, granted you keep the news to yourself, Kitty said. Of course, Emma said. Lizzie agreed. As long as you do not name the baby Elizabeth. The three women laughed heartily together as they sipped the tea and nibbled on sandwiches delivered by one of the maidservants. If I had known what I know now, I would have hoped to wait a few months before becoming with child. The heat can be quite unbearable at times. I wish that I had been introduced to William before your wedding, Kitty. That way, we may have avoided that terrible first meeting in the garden where William was under the impression he was charm personified, Emma chimed in. But that was certainly the effect of the whiskey he had consumed that day. Believe it or not, he was even more obnoxious when he was sober, especially before you met him. You would not have liked him one bit, Lizzie stated. As opposed to the first time I met him, Emma chuckled, and Kitty and Lizzie joined in her laughter. Lizzie. What about you? Emma inquired. What about me? Lizzie asked. If you were given the chance to go back in time and change one thing in your life, what would it be? That is an easy question, Lizzie answered, and drew in a sad breath. It would be the day before I first met Carson in the garden. He had snuck through the hole in the wall, exploring. Why the day before? Kitty asked. To ask Edward to close the hole so Carson could not climb through. Emma and Kitty both gasped, and Lizzie suddenly felt guilty for saying such a thing out loud. She lowered her gaze. Emma reached out and placed her hand over Lizzie's, softly whispering, I am truly sorry for your sadness, Lizzie. It is my own fault. I didn't possess the courage to inform Carson of my feelings. I was terrified of being rejected, of ruining our perfect friendship. But now, because of my cowardice, even our friendship is over. The last words I said to him were to leave my sight. Because at that moment I thought it was what I wanted, what he deserved. He doesn't deserve someone like me, but he certainly doesn't deserve someone like Miss Saunders either. She will break him and make him bitter and resentful. He deserves better. You are a wonderful young woman, Lizzie, despite what you believe to be true, the Duchess answered. But merely weeks ago, you 
wished me to leave the estate because I was seen as a bad influence, Lizzie uttered. Is that true? Emma sat up straight and turned to her friend. It was, but Lizzie has changed. She's kept her promise to me, and I have noticed the difference. James has noticed too, though he was not the one who decided to ask you to stay. It was I. I want you here, Lizzie. I want both of you. Because I must admit, I am terrified of having this child, and you both are the only reason I appear as calm as I do. Oh, Kitty, Lizzie whispered. I had no idea. You don't have to be scared. We are here, Emma said. We won't allow anything bad to happen to you or the child, Lizzie promised with an encouraging smile. Thank you. I am truly grateful for you both. The Duchess smiled tremulously and glanced at Lizzie. And I am deeply sorry that I made you feel anything but welcome in your own home. There is no need to apologise, Your Grace. Lizzie said. Admittedly, I was not the best guest in the world before, and my behaviour was clearly not what it should have been. We adore you just the way you are, the Duchess stated with a smile. The mere fact that you are acknowledging your wrongdoings and striving to better yourself is wonderful and admirable. Thank you, Lizzie smiled. The light-hearted atmosphere in the parlour was truly delightful from that moment onward, and it allowed Lizzie to feel at ease and forget about her woes. And about Carson. Even if only for a short while. Chapter 14 The moment Carson's coach came to a standstill, he jumped out and stepped onto the dusty cobblestone path that led to the lavish townhouse across the street. He straightened his shoulders as he climbed the wooden steps leading to the front door. He banged the copper knocker loudly and with force against the door and waited for a few moments. When the door opened, a young maidservant greeted him with a polite smile. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, he reciprocated with a nod. Is Miss Saunders home? I wish to speak to her. Tell her Mr. Wallace is here. Certainly, Mr. Wallace. I shall escort you to the parlour while I inform Miss Violet of your arrival. He followed her into the parlour, then waited while the young maidservant left to fetch her mistress. Carson ran his fingers through his hair and drew in a deep breath before slowly exhaling. Footsteps sounded in the hallway, and as he turned, Miss Saunders appeared in the doorway. Carson, she smiled happily. How good of you to come to visit me. I am terribly sorry that you must see me in such a state, but I was not aware you would be calling. Carson glanced at her, knowing well enough that she always wore the best dresses, and she would not dream of being anything less than perfectly turned out at any time. False modesty was not attractive in his view. As she approached, she reached out her hand to touch him. He stepped back, his jaw clenched. Is something the matter? she asked with a furrowed brow. Indeed, yes. There is something I wish to speak with you about. Is everything all right? You seem upset. I am upset, Carson answered. I had an interesting conversation with my sister, and it disturbed me very much. What did she say? Miss Saunders inquired. She told me of an incident that occurred at the tea room. Miss Saunders' eyebrows fluttered upwards and her eyes widened. What incident might that be? The incident where you threatened Lady Emma and Her Grace and badmouthed Lady Elizabeth Seymour, Carson answered, and crossed his arms. What do you have to say about that? It's not true. Why on earth would I ever threaten anyone? Miss Saunders pouted innocently, fluttering her lashes at Carson. I do not believe you, Carson stated. She narrowed her eyes and stepped back. I would not lie to you, Carson. Then you are accusing everyone else who was in the tea room to be liars, Carson asked. I didn't say that, she contended. 
Those Seymour women despise me for some inexplicable reason, and they are targeting me. They have probably enlisted others to support their lies. Carson rolled his eyes. Such nonsense you speak. Everything that comes out of your mouth is nonsense. Miss Saunders gasped and pressed her hand theatrically against her bosom. How dare you speak to me in such a manner? And how dare you threaten the wives of the Seymour brothers? Are you not aware of the difference in your stations? Your father may be chief magistrate, but her grace is the wife of the Duke of Somerset. Still, she does not lord her position over others, and nor do Lady Emma or Lady Elizabeth. Your father's position does not make you better than anyone else. Nor does it give you the right or the leniency to threaten people with the law, Carson growled. There is no need for insult, Carson. It is Mr. Wallace to you. And there was no need to try and establish your dominance over Lady Emma or her grace. But especially not toward Elizabeth Seymour, you mean? Miss Saunders crossed her arms. Why do you continue to defend her? She was the one who insulted me in front of my group of ladies. She was disrespectful toward me, and frankly, I am not surprised. I was surprised, however, that she had the audacity to even visit the tea room. A woman such as she should not be allowed in refined places where proper ladies gather. Carson's jaw clenched as he stared at this hideous woman in disbelief. Do not look at me in such a manner, Carson. I mean, Mr. Wallace. You are well aware of the stories that circulated about the things she had done, and with married men as well. Clearly, she doesn't care which homes she rips apart as long as she gets what she wants, Miss Saunders muttered the words angrily. Carson shook his head. I cannot believe that you have the audacity to utter such nonsense in my presence. Is she not a terrible person? Miss Saunders asked, her eyes going wide and innocent-looking. Carson didn't bother to contain the growl that rose in his throat. Not in the least. I have known her for a very long time, and she is one of the best people I have ever met. You cannot know that for sure. People have the tendency to hide who they truly are from the people closest to them, Miss Saunders said or those whom they wish to fool into marrying them. She narrowed her dark eyes and glared accusingly at Carson. And what precisely are you insinuating? I am not insinuating anything. I am telling you. You are a vile, uncouth and insensitive woman. You do not see the good in people, and other women only entertain your company so they can be associated with the Saunders' name which has, in all fairness, lost its appeal ever since your mother passed, bless her soul. Miss Saunders' jaw dropped, and her face began to change colour, her cheeks and neck reddening. Carson, however, was completely and utterly unaffected by the sight. You are rude, and you gossip. You spread lies that are both hurtful and inappropriate, and you possess no conscience with regards to your wrongdoings. You blame others for your own mistakes, and cannot bear the thought of seeing others happier than you are. She stared at Carson, her breathing ragged and her mouth turned into a scowl. You are a mean man. How dare you speak to me in such a manner? I have remained silent for too long. I have allowed people to make my choices for me, thinking they know what is best for me. I permitted them to do so as I didn't wish to insult them or seem ungrateful. My sister was the one who arranged our meeting. I agreed, as I believed my sister would not introduce me to someone whom I could not stand. After all, she knows me. Carson shrugged and dropped his hands to his sides. But I made the mistake of trusting her. I trusted her with an important decision regarding my future, and I should not have done so. I am a mistake to you, she asked, her eyebrows flying up. The biggest, but I am to blame for it, as I allowed this to drag on for much too long, 
Carson muttered. I will not marry you, Miss Saunders. In fact, I had no intention of ever marrying you, and I am here now to make that very clear. It is because of Lizzie, is it not? she asked bitterly. I do not like you, Miss Saunders. That is enough reason not to marry. You don't need to admit it. It is written all over your face, Miss Saunders pointed out. You wish to hear an honest word come from my mouth, yet you stand there and not only lie to me, but lie to yourself as well. You are in love with that woman, Lizzie, a whore, and you... You will not use that derogatory term in my presence, Carson warned, raising his hand in the air. You do not have the right to justify yourself by diminishing Lizzie. Leave, Miss Saunders whispered, her face becoming pale instead of red. Leave right now. With pleasure, Carson said. Good day. He walked past her without another word, past several house servants standing with open mouths in the hallway, and quietly left the townhouse. There was a happy feeling inside his heart, a feeling he had not experienced in a very long time. Time to put things right. Chapter 15 Emma and Lizzie sat on either side of the chess table in the drawing room, quietly playing a casual game. Lizzie cocked her head as she watched Emma shift her rook forward, pursing her lips as she did so. I cannot believe it took us so long to play a game of chess together. Emma expressed, and glanced at Lizzie. You are much more skilled than I initially imagined, Lizzie admitted. I will graciously accept that compliment, Emma grinned. William taught me one evening while we spent a rainy night in the hull of the ship on our way to Denmark. It was a terrifying storm, and William tried to distract me. I was growing rather hysterical, I have to admit. I can only imagine... Lizzie answered. But Will always had a gift of making one feel at ease in even the worst situation. James as well. That is why I love them, despite their annoying traits. Emma smiled, and as she was about to respond, the door opened. Will appeared in the doorway. Good afternoon, William. Are your ears burning? We were just talking about you, Lizzie greeted him. All good things, I assume. Will approached the two women and bent down to kiss his wife. My love. I was merely telling Lizzie about when you taught me the rules of chess, Emma smiled. Ah, I remember that night as though it were yesterday. Will sighed dreamily. Of course, she clung to me as though her life depended on it, and gentleman that I am, I simply provided her the means to distract her from her turmoil. And thus, no doubt, creating an even larger turmoil, Lizzie muttered with a slight cringe. A true gentleman does not speak of such intimate details, Will said with a wink. Since when has that ever stopped you? Lizzie chuckled, and the others joined in her laughter. Luckily, I am in too happy a mood to take any offence, Will grinned. Why are you in such a happy mood, my love? Emma inquired. I heard some delightful news that is sure to place a smile on your faces, Will answered. He pointed at Lizzie. What could you possibly have to tell me, William? Lizzie inquired, with a furrowed brow. I heard, Will spoke slowly and crouched down beside Emma, that Carson ended his engagement with the vile Miss Saunders, in quite the spectacular fashion, too. Lizzie's gaze shifted directly to his, and she scowled. That is not amusing, William. Please don't jest. I do not jest, Will muttered defensively, and held up his hands. Where did you hear this? Emma inquired. I heard it from Edward, Will pronounced. Lizzie's throat became thick and she swallowed hard. The gardener? Emma asked, sounding confused. Indeed. He heard it from the Margate's head stable boy, who heard it from one of the footmen in the Saunders household, who is seeing one of the housemaids, who apparently witnessed a shouting match in the parlour. 
goodness, Lizzie said faintly. I trust Edward, Will said. He is no liar. Lizzie knew this to be true. Edward was a valued employee and a gentleman in the true sense of the word. Lizzie leaned forward. Tell me exactly what he told you. Well, apart from that convoluted train of hearsay, Edward also directly overheard Carson speaking to Adrienne, telling her that he had broken off the engagement that he had apparently not even been privy to. It had been arranged by the two women, it seems, and he confirmed that he never wished to see Miss Saunders again. Adrienne was livid, but Carson didn't care. He said he was tired of her controlling the direction in which his life should go, and he even told her to stay out of his affairs or he would have her sent to Aberystwyth. Lizzie fell back in her chair. Could it really be? Did Carson know of his mother's secret? Aberystwyth, Emma asked with a frown. Lizzie nodded. His mother is there. Will glanced at her in disbelief and stuttered a reply. How on earth do you know that? I know everything about Carson and his family. He is my best friend, after all. Lizzie shrugged nonchalantly. Wait a moment. Is Carson aware of you knowing? Will asked. Lizzie shook her head. No, of course not. Don't be daft, brother. He wouldn't speak to me again if he knew. Why is that, dear sister? Will asked with a smug grin. Ah, uh, I didn't precisely find out the information by Carson telling me himself, Lizzie answered with a cringe. Will's mouth dropped open, then he got to his feet once again. I cannot believe you, Lizzie. You were going through his father's things. Again, don't be daft, Lizzie rolled her eyes. Carson asked me to assist him in sorting through the items in his father's study after he passed away. I came across a box with letters addressed to the late Mr. Wallace, Carson's father. They were from his mother. What did they say? Emma asked, her eyes sparkling with intrigue. Lizzie sat up a little straighter, her stomach tugging with discomfort at revealing the intimate knowledge. But since Will had already obtained some of the facts, she had to assume she could trust her family with the information. Carson's mother was the daughter of the late King of Wales. She left Somerset after her father had been taken ill, as he had left the title of Princess of Wales to her, if she wanted it. Carson's father was upset and gave her an ultimatum to choose between him or her old family. But she left anyway. She had to fulfil her family legacy. The letters were to Carson's father, informing him that she would be staying in Aberystwyth permanently, and she wished for Carson, Adrienne and Mr. Wallace to join her, but his father refused. He didn't wish to uproot his children. His mother is a Welsh princess, Emma gasped with wide eyes. Is he aware? I didn't think so, though if he's mentioned Aberystwyth, I didn't utter a word as it wasn't my place to do so. I removed the box from the study and buried it in our garden, near the hole in the wall, Lizzie answered, though she still wondered if she'd done the right thing that day. What does that make him? Emma asked, her eyes wide. A duke or a prince, I am not too sure. If his father didn't possess a title, then he may never have been given one either, Will explained. An influential businessman who married a princess and hid the knowledge from his children in order to protect them, Emma summarised. It sounds as if it belongs between the pages of a novel in the library. Indeed, but it is his life. Perhaps I ought to speak to him, Lizzie suggested. And say what? Are you aware you are the son of a Welsh princess? Emma muttered. Not with regards to that, Emma. Regarding the engagement he ended, Lizzie pointed out. Perhaps that is not a good plan, Lizzie, Will warned. I will not gloat that I was right about Miss Saunders and that he should have listened to me. It is not my intention to shame him. I merely wish to know whether he is fine. Will and Emma glanced at one another and sighed. 
Sister, you must remember that Carson is now in a powerful place in his life. He stood up for himself against his sister, and his entire family for that matter. He decided what was best, and perhaps he decided that it was time to let go of his past feelings, Will said. What do you mean, his past feelings? Lizzie asked. Perhaps it is time you told her, my love, Emma suggested to Will. Tell me what, Lizzie insisted, and glanced at Will. What is going on? Will drew in a slow breath and gazed at Lizzie. Carson has been in love with you for many years. Lizzie's brows rose, and she felt her heart break free from its cage. The metal bars sprung open, and her voice came out in a high-pitched squeak. He told you that! How could her brother have withheld the information for so long? He didn't admit it, but he didn't deny it either. It was clear in the way he gazed upon you when you weren't aware of it. He simply didn't possess the courage to make his feelings for you known. He didn't consider himself worthy of you, as you are the daughter of a duke, and he was a simple man without a title, Will explained. But it doesn't matter to me if he was born with or without a title, wealth, or any of those superficial and material things. He has always been enough for me, perfect the way he is. And that hasn't changed, Lizzie breathed her pulse fluttering in her throat. I cannot believe I have been so blind. He did have the ability to hide it very well, Will stated. But I have known him for as long as you have, and he spoke of you constantly. Lizzie's eyes filled with tears, and a smile formed on her lips. She stood from the chair and drew in an unsteady breath. Perhaps it is time for me to finally be honest with Carson, and with myself. Lizzie rushed to the wall in their garden as thick clouds formed overhead, but smiled happily as she climbed through the hole. Not even the dark skies or an impending storm could deter her from her mission. The vines and ivy had been entirely cleared, which made it easier to climb through. So she made her way across the lawn and stepped onto the cobblestone path. Her heart pounded in her chest, but there was a peaceful feeling inside her as well. She finally had the courage to tell Carson that she had loved him for such a long time, and those feelings had become truly uncontrollable and undeniable. She repeated the words in her head, as she had done for years, attempting to find the perfect moment to say them to Carson. She stopped suddenly, realizing that there was no such thing as a perfect moment to do something. She had wasted so many years waiting for the perfect moment that she had almost lost Carson entirely. A bolt of lightning illuminated the skies momentarily as she quietly opened the door and stepped inside Ferngrove Manor. All was quiet, and she decided that even if Carson was not there, she would certainly wait for him. As she was halfway down the hallway, she heard noises coming from the study, and she hastily walked down the hallway. As she reached the door of the study, loosening her shawl, feeling rather anxious, she stopped abruptly as she saw Miss Adrienne standing beside the bookshelves. Her heart sank, but she kept her composure. Miss Adrienne, Lizzie greeted. Lizzie, Miss Adrienne answered stiffly. What are you doing here? I came to speak with Carson. Is he here? No, he is not. And I suggest that you leave before he returns, Miss Adrienne answered, with a malicious tone. Why is that? Lizzie asked, as she placed her shawl over the backrest of Carson's favourite leather chair. She wasn't leaving just because Adrienne told her to. He does not wish to see you or have you visit the estate ever again. You have ruined his life more than once, and neither he nor I will allow you to do it again. Miss Adrienne spat at her. Lizzie narrowed her eyes at the older woman. What do you mean? I only wish the best for him. So you say, my lady, Miss Adrienne uttered and stepped away from the bookshelves. I have seen my brother heartbroken over you too many times, seeing you being courted by other men, 
throwing it in his face. The affair with Lord Dorset was the final nail in the coffin for him. He tried to remain stoic and keep to himself, but you insisted upon seeing him, calling upon him for assistance. Using him as you saw fit, only to benefit yourself. Even when he was betrothed to Miss Saunders, you sought out a way to alienate their relationship, knowing that you had the power to influence him without his knowledge. No, that was not my intention, Lizzie defended, and placed her hand against her chest. I care very much for your brother, Miss Adrienne, and I would never intentionally hurt him or cause him any pain. If you truly cared for him, you would leave him be. He deserves better, Miss Adrienne stated firmly. A tear ran down Lizzie's cheek, and she lowered her gaze. She turned away, but Adrienne hadn't finished. You are ruining him, Lizzie, and any chance of him finding happiness. You have him in a stranglehold. And you do it so eloquently that he does not even realise it. He will do anything to please you, to ensure your safety and happiness, even if it is at the risk of his own. I didn't realise that was what I was doing, Lizzie answered sadly, as she turned back around, another tear running down her cheek. Love can make us do foolish and selfish things, my lady, Miss Adrienne muttered, and slowly approached her. But it is sometimes necessary for us to rectify those mistakes, even if it means letting that person go. Lizzie nodded slowly. Would you please tell Carson that I am deeply sorry? I will do that, Miss Adrienne nodded. Lizzie turned away and rushed back down the hallway. She opened the door and gasped as the rain poured heavily outside. She didn't care. She needed to get away from the horrible words and the guilt that now clawed at her. Was she really the woman that Adrienne painted? Had she poisoned Carson's love for her and used it to hold him prisoner? She rushed outside, and the rain drenched her instantly, soaking her dress and making the cold material cling to her skin. Her tears mixed with the rain, and as she staggered through the garden, she didn't know where her tears ended, and the rain began. Chapter 16 the rain poured heavily, rattling the window of the library where Carson stood quietly. There had been significant progress with the renovations, but they were not yet done. However, the fresh smell of new wood was delightful. He looked forward to seeing the completed product and knew that his father would be proud of him for restoring it to the best of his ability. His thoughts journeyed to his mother, who was now in Aberystwyth, and he wondered how she was. Was she happy? Had she remarried and had a family? Carson also wondered whether she thought of him and Adrienne at all. He had considered writing her a lengthy and emotional letter, explaining how he had not been aware of the situation and that he didn't despise her for abandoning them. He'd been told the wrong story. He had tried writing that very letter, but he had not found the words to start. How would he address her? Mother? Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales? Or had she become Queen? Carson was perplexed and filled with confusion. As the rain quieted down, he heard voices down the hallway, but he couldn't distinguish who they belonged to. After he heard footsteps in the hallway and a door slammed loudly, he made his way toward the study, where he knew Adrienne was attempting to make space for the books that belonged in the library but had been placed inside the study in the meanwhile. Adrienne seemed distracted, and a strange expression was present on her face. Adrienne, is everything all right? Carson inquired. She seemed taken by surprise with his sudden entrance, but she nodded and crossed her arms. Everything is perfectly fine. Did you have a visitor? It was no one important. You are rather pale, sister. Are you certain everything is well? Carson narrowed his eyes as he slowly approached his sister. Who was here? As I mentioned, 
It was no one important. Adrienne shrugged and turned away. Something was clearly the matter, but Carson could not put his finger on it. There was most definitely something amiss. A familiar scent filled his nose and he glanced down. Draped over the backrest, he noticed the shawl. He recognised the soft fabric with the lace trim immediately and reached his hand out to touch it. Where did this come from? Adrienne glanced at him over her shoulder, but shrugged. Perhaps it was one of the maidservants who left it here. I do not appreciate your lies, Adrienne. What lies have I told you now, Carson? Adrienne sighed. This is not one of the maidservants' shawls. They do not own anything of the sort, Carson stated. This belongs to Lizzie. Carson held up the shawl. Does it? Why is it here? I do not know, Carson. Perhaps she left it here when she was here the last time. She was here earlier, was she not? Carson asked, and pointed his finger at Miss Adrienne. Do not dare lie to me again. Adrienne sighed and nodded. She was. Why did you not inform me she was here? Carson demanded to know. I didn't wish to disturb you. Stop lying to me, Adrienne, he yelled, frustration tearing at him now. His sister obviously hadn't learned anything from their previous conversations. You know exactly why I didn't wish for her to speak with you. She will manipulate you as she has done your entire friendship, Adrienne stated and crossed her arms. I will not allow her to influence you any longer. How on earth did she manipulate me? You have tried to make me feel guilty for not doing what father would approve of. Then you have the audacity to throw mother's situation before me and convince me that marrying Miss Saunders was the best thing for me and the family. But it was all nonsense. You are the only manipulative person here. Not Lizzie. She has spent our entire friendship wanting me to be happy. She protected me, she consoled me, and she was there for me when I needed someone. She didn't expect anything in return, and that is why, according to you, I keep defending her. Lizzie made me feel that I belonged in this world. Titles mattered not to Lizzie, and they never will. How can you be so certain? Those tales circulating of her. Carson held up his hand. That is precisely the same nonsense as those tales that had circulated about Mother after she left. I swear to no longer believe a single word coming from anyone's mouths any longer. Only those I trust. Not even you, Adrienne. But I am your sister, she declared, both hands going to her hips. Carson shook his head. That is immaterial. Being blood does not excuse you from repeatedly lying to me and deceiving me. But I told you about Mother and... You manipulated me. That is the point, Adrienne. You broke my trust the moment you lied to me. You knew how devastated I was after Mother left. I was convinced that it was because of me that she had made that choice that I was not the son she'd wished for. I blamed myself for a long while. One afternoon, Lizzie and I sat in the garden, and she clearly saw that something was wrong. I told her what was weighing on my heart, and she told me that people will come and go in a person's life, but it is their prerogative if they leave. It has nothing to do with the people whom they leave behind, and that I should not allow it to affect me. I was not the person at fault. She was right. She has always been right, Carson explained. When the tales started with regards to Lizzie and Lord Dorset, I didn't believe them, as I knew she was not that kind of woman. She has too much self-respect to allow a man such as Lord Dorset to defile her. Adrienne narrowed her eyes at him. You do not honestly believe that she is still pure and untouched, Carson. 
The only thing that matters to me is that her heart is pure and her mind untouched. I am not pure and untouched, and neither are you, sister dear. But you would not think of yourself as a whore, or me as a rake, would you? No, but— Exactly, sister. You judge people before you even allow yourself to know them, or know their circumstances. You have never truly liked Lizzie. Why is that? Carson asked. Adrienne hesitated for a moment and drew in a breath. Tell me now, Carson demanded. Mother truly adored her, and she had told me this many times while she watched you and Lizzie together. She believed that you two would marry, to which she willingly gave her blessing. She even said that she would make a fine princess one day, if that were to happen. I hated that she considered Lizzie important enough to be named as a princess, and didn't once refer to me as being worthy. She considered some other girl more important than her own daughter, Adrienne said bitterly. From that day, I despised Lizzie, and I've done everything in my power to prevent Mother's wish from coming true. Carson's stomach dropped, and part of his heart broke at the same time. All this time, he had thought his sister knew best. Had his best interests at heart. How wrong could a person be? You are a vile and despicable woman, Carson hissed. Mother was certainly right. You do not deserve the title of princess. Adrienne's eyes filled with tears and she lowered her gaze. I am sorry, Carson. I don't believe you, and I don't wish to hear your apologies, Adrienne. You made me lose the one person who meant the absolute world to me. The one person whom I would do anything for. You are in love with her. Yes, I am, Carson answered with confidence. I am in love with Lizzie, and nothing on this earth can change my feelings for her. Of course, I would not expect you to understand how it feels to truly love someone. The only person you have ever truly loved was yourself. Adrienne bit her quivering bottom lip. Your words hurt me, Carson. Good. They were meant to, Carson retorted, and whirled around, hastily leaving the study. Carson rushed to the front door, and as he opened it, the rain poured down hard outside. His eye caught movement to his left, and he noticed Lizzie in the far distance, making her way back toward Woodlock Manor. Lizzie, he called out, running after her, but the heavy rain drowned out his voice. Carson continued to run after her, his hair sticking to his face. When he reached the hole in the wall, he climbed through it easily. Thank goodness he and Edward had cleared the ivy and vines away. It was much easier to get through now. As he stepped onto the grass lawn of Woodlock Manor, he saw Lizzie had changed directions and was now running toward the stables. Lizzie, he called out again and continued to run. He followed her and rushed inside the stables. A shiver ran down his spine. He was completely drenched. Lizzie he called out to her, gently this time. After a few moments of silence, Lizzie appeared from the shadows, also drenched to the bone. Her eyes were red, and her breathing was ragged. What are you doing here? Lizzie whispered. I came to speak to you. Why? To ask me to stay away from you and never to set foot at Ferngrove Manor again, Lizzie answered her voice breaking from the sadness obvious in her tone. Why would I wish for you to stay away from me? Carson asked. Lizzie wiped her cheek with her sleeve, although it didn't dry her skin in the least, and shrugged her shoulders. Adrian informed me that was what you wanted. Please, Lizzie, you must not believe a single word my sister said, Carson said. He approached Lizzie. I cannot imagine wanting you to never come near me. You are much too important to me. She lifted her head and met his gaze directly. I am. Of course, Carson answered, 
and took both her hands in his. You are the most important person to me in the entire world. Lizzie coughed softly, clearing her throat. But I constantly hurt you by being selfish. Is that another one of Adrienne's attempts to make you feel as though you are the one at fault? Carson asked. Lizzie shook her head. I do not understand. Carson sighed. My sister was jealous that my mother considered you more of a daughter to her than Adrienne. This is why she has been treating you in the manner she has this entire time. Really? Lizzie whispered. I am truly sorry for my sister's behavior. I cannot begin to describe the sorrow it has caused my heart, Carson said. Lizzie smiled as she slid her hands out of Carson's and placed one hand against his chest and the other she pressed lightly against his cheek. You do not need to apologize for the wrongdoings and jealousy of your sister, Carson. You are not your sister. You have always treated me with respect and cared for me when I had no one else. You stood by me during the darkest times of my life and you defended me without fail. It was the least I could do, and I would gladly do it all again for you. Carson gazed down into her light eyes, his heart pounding, his body filling with desire. A desire he could no longer contain. And he had no reason any longer to even try. Chapter 17 A lump formed in Lizzie's throat as she stared up at Carson. He was so close to her. She ran her fingers through his damp, tousled hair, her heart skipping a beat. Carson brought his own hands up and cradled her face, the touch chilly but so welcome. You are beautiful, Lizzie, and I do apologize for waiting so long. Waiting so long for what? Lizzie breathed. To do this, Carson whispered in return. He leaned in close, and their lips met in a tender and loving moment, his hand still cradling her face. Love and desire exploded within her, her heart pounding in her chest. Lizzie ran her fingers along Carson's torso, her hands searching for the hem of his shirt tucked into his trousers. His skin was warm against her cold, shivering fingers, and he drew in a breath against her lips. Sorry, Lizzie whispered. Allow me to warm you up, my lady, Carson whispered, his eyes sparkling with charm and mischief. He scooped her up into his arms and moved to a more comfortable place in the stables. Carson lay Lizzie on the soft hay in the corner of an empty stall, and her heart continued to pound in her chest. Carson's lips met hers once more as he lay beside her, his hands lovingly touching her body. Lizzie had waited her entire life to feel his hands touch her in such a manner, and even now, as it happened, she wanted to pinch herself in case it wasn't real. Would she wake at any moment and find herself alone in her bedchamber? The rain continued to drum against the windows, but the horses in the stables were all peaceful and resting, not taking notice of the passion that had started to build between the two lovers who had finally found one another. Carson loosened the lace ribbon in the front of Lizzie's dress and slid her sleeves down her shoulders and arms. Her skin was still cold to the touch, but within moments it began to warm up. The rain continued to pour down as the sun was replaced by the moon, but even though she wanted to ignore time, Lizzie was well aware that she had been gone from the manor house for a long while. She didn't wish for her brothers to worry over her. We must go. We would not want Will and James to fret about me, or worse, assemble a search party to look for me, Lizzie whispered, as she ran her fingers down Carson's naked chest. Please, I wish only to hold you for a while longer, Carson murmured beside her, and wrapped his arms lovingly around her. A warm and welcoming feeling exploded in her heart as she melted into Carson, drifting off into a deep and peaceful slumber, having everything she had ever wanted in her arms. 
Chapter 18 Carson was awoken by the sound of violent coughing, and he opened his eyes. Lizzie lay on her side, her back to him, a sheath of perspiration decorating her skin. Lizzie, are you all right? he whispered as he turned her to face him. The moment he touched her skin, he realized there was something very wrong. Her skin was hot to the touch, and as she weakly turned her head toward him, he noticed how dark the skin under her eyes had become. Are you feeling ill, my dear? I feel very warm, and not in a good way, Lizzie answered. I shall take you back to the manor now. I have kept you out here in the cold stables for long enough. It took Carson a few moments to ensure both Lizzie and he were adequately dressed before he scooped her up into his arms and left the stables. Her body was hot against his chest as he proceeded to hurry back to Woodlock Manor. He banged on the door with his foot, and within moments the door was opened by a manservant. Call his grace and will to the drawing room immediately, Carson barked, and the manservant quickly obeyed. Carson continued down the hallway until he reached the drawing room. He entered and gently lay Lizzie on the long chaise. She weakly grabbed his hand and he clutched it tightly. I am here, my love. Within moments, both James and Will rushed into the room. Carson, what is the matter? the Duke asked, but as he noticed a very pale Lizzie lying on the chaise, his eyes widened. Lizzie! Lizzie opened her eyes weakly and attempted a reassuring smile. James's jaw clenched as he ran his fingers through Lizzie's damp hair. She has a fever, the Duke pointed out, as he pressed his palm against her forehead. She is burning to the touch. What happened? Will inquired, and glanced at Carson. We were caught in the rain and took refuge in the stables. The entire day, and half the night, Will asked apprehensively. Carson lowered his gaze for a moment and said, We didn't realize how much time had passed. We both fell asleep, and I awoke to her violent coughs. She was covered in a sheath of perspiration and feverish. William, call Hamilton to take the coach and fetch Dr. Ferguson. He must come at once, James ordered, and William nodded, leaving immediately. James turned to him. Carson, would you be able to carry Lizzie upstairs to her bedchamber? Of course, Carson nodded. Good. I will call upon Francis to see to her until the physician arrives. Do not leave her side, the Duke ordered. I do not intend to, Carson stated and rose to his feet. He scooped Lizzie up in his arms once again and whispered, We will ensure you are taken care of. Carson held her tightly against his chest, her body curled up against him and shivering violently. He swiftly ascended the stairs and walked directly to Lizzie's bedchamber. Francis and two maidservants joined him. Francis hurried out in front and opened the door for him. He stepped inside her chambers, the maidservants following closely behind him. A maid on their side of the bed peeled the blankets away, and Carson placed Lizzie gently on the mattress. He stepped away for a moment, allowing the maidservants to cover her with rags drenched in cool water. His heart broke as he watched her on the bed, her face pale and her body shivering. A short while later, Will entered with Dr. Ferguson, the physician, and Carson was asked to leave the chambers in order for the physician to examine Lizzie in the presence of Francis, of course. It felt like hours to Carson while he and Will, along with Lady Emma, waited outside. Finally the door opened, and Dr. Ferguson appeared in the doorway with his medical bag. Will and Carson approached him, and Will asked, How is she? Dr. Ferguson adjusted his spectacles on his nose and spoke slowly. Lizzie has pleurisy, as well as a high fever. Carson bit his bottom lip and his jaw clenched. He was no stranger to pleurisy as his father had contracted it, as well as Adrienne when she was a child. She had nearly lost her life due to it, and his father had. 
My apologies, Dr. Ferguson, but what precisely is pleurisy? Emma inquired. It is a swelling of the lungs that causes coughing and shortness of breath. I have seen many patients with this condition. It seems as though Lizzie contracted the illness due to elongated exposure to the elements, especially the rain. And the mortality rate of this? Emma inquired. Dr. Ferguson hesitated and glanced at Emma, which caused an unsettling feeling in the pit of Carson's stomach. He knew only too well that it was high. She requires rest. The cold rags on her arms and chest do help with the fever. I have instructed Francis to give Lizzie milkweed every few hours, as it eases her breathing difficulties, the pain in her chest, and it will lessen the inflammation. The doctor turned to Will. I am not certain whether my lord is open to leeches, as they would also help to cleanse the blood. As Carson was about to respond, Will interjected by shaking his head. No leeches. She becomes easily light-headed, and it will only put extra risk on her life. It happened when she was younger, and we will not take that chance. The doctor nodded. Very well. I will return in a day or two to examine her once more, to see if there is any improvement. And if there is not, Carson insisted. You can call upon me any time, Mr. Ferguson informed them, and quietly left. Carson ran his fingers through his hair in frustration and felt Will's hand on his shoulder, offering him some comfort. My sister is strong, Carson, Will uttered. Perhaps you and I could retreat to the drawing room. Carson's brow furrowed and he glanced at the closed door for a moment. I promised her that I would not leave her side. She requires rest and Francis is with her. Francis has looked after Lizzie many times in the past and we trust her implicitly. Carson nodded and followed Will to the upstairs drawing room. James was already there, pacing to and fro. Lizzie has contracted pleurisy and a high fever. She has to take milkweed, which will ease her breathing and her pain, and the wet rags against her skin will certainly help with the fever, Will informed. She requires rest, and Dr. Ferguson will examine her again in a few days. The Duke nodded quietly and pursed his lips. This is all my fault, Carson admitted. I was the one who kept her in the stables longer. Her illness would have been entirely avoided had I not been selfish and wished to keep her there. You are not at fault, Carson, Will defended. No, he is right. He was selfish and negligent with our sister, James answered, and glared at Carson. But I am certain that you meant no harm to her. Of course not, Carson insisted, and took a step forward. I love Lizzie. I always have, and I would do anything in this world to ensure her safety. I am willing to send for our family physician, but he would only be able to arrive in a day. It is quite a long journey. I am even willing to pay. There is no need to prove your loyalty to Lizzie. We are already aware of it, the Duke interjected as he raised his hand. You are. Indeed. You have been a devoted friend for as long as you have known her. You have defended her, consoled her, and kept her safe through it all, James answered. And for that, we cannot express how grateful we are to you. Carson nodded quietly, and his jaw clenched. I love her, so it is only natural. I've always felt that I wasn't good enough for her, and it stopped me from admitting my feelings to her but it didn't stop me from being someone on whom she could depend. You never have to feel that way ever again, Carson. You are family. You always have been, and always will be, Will stated, as he approached Carson and embraced his friend. Thank you both, Carson replied with gratitude. Your words mean the world to me. There is, however, another matter we probably need to discuss. James said. Anything I can do to assist? Carson asked. What are your intentions toward our sister? To love her, to marry her, 
and to make her as happy as she possibly can be, Carson answered, without even a moment's hesitation. I wish to spend every waking moment with her, and every other moment beside her. I will continue to protect her, defend her, and ensure that she is the best version of herself she possibly can be. I wish to build a home with her at Ferngrove Manor and have a family that I am proud of. I wish to grow old with her and die lying in her arms. Will and James exchanged satisfied glances, and the Duke uttered, Spoken like a true royal. Carson frowned and glanced at Will. How long have you known? A few years, but it doesn't change a thing, let me assure you. You will always remain the man you are, Will said with a shrug. At least you will to me. Does Lizzie know? Carson asked. Perhaps you can speak to her when she is better, but I can already assure you it won't matter to her, Will answered, then said with a smirk. Although I never imagined that one day she would outrank us. Ranks and titles don't mean a thing if you don't behave accordingly, and you, Carson, deserve to carry that title with pride, James said warmly. And it would give me tremendous pride to have you as part of our family. Officially, of course. Carson smiled gratefully and lowered his gaze. Thank you, but it is I who am honoured to have you both think so highly of me. After all these years of feeling substandard, it seemed like everything was coming full circle. Now, if only Lizzie would get better. He couldn't bear the thought that she might not. A few nights later, Carson finally felt her stir. His entire world seemed to stop spinning as her hand moved from under his and he glanced at her face. My dearest Lizzie. Can you hear me? he whispered. Carson, she mumbled, and tiredly opened her eyes. Carson shifted closer to her, and a relieved smile formed on his lips. I am here. It is cold in here, she mumbled. Can you light the hearth? Perhaps I can offer a better solution, he suggested. Carson slowly climbed in beside her in bed and held her close to him, as he had in the stables. Only this time he was very careful how he was holding her. Her skin still burned under his touch, despite her words insisting she was cold. Her scalp was damp, causing small tendrils of her hair to stick against her hairline. Her cheeks were still pale as he kissed her forehead and rested his head against the pillow. This is my fault. I should have taken you home when you told me to. I only wish to have you to myself for a while longer. If something were to happen to you, it would be the end of me, he whispered, but Lizzie didn't respond. Carson glanced down and noticed she had fallen asleep once more, as she had been doing for a few days now. She slipped in and out of consciousness often, and when she did respond, her words were slurred and incoherent at times. Carson feared for the worst as her body became limp, but her laboured breathing indicated that she was still alive. And so did, of course, her heart beating steadily in her chest. It may not be spring yet, my lady, but I will gladly marry you, Carson whispered as he stroked her hand. All I ask of you is to get better. A loud breath expelled from Lizzie's lips and a quiet whisper filled the air. Simple words that carried the weight of Carson's entire world. Simple words that filled him with a lifetime of hope. For you, anything. Chapter 19 After nearly a fortnight of being bedridden, her maidservants entering with cold rags to place upon her body, and many nightmares that plagued her fragile mind, Lizzie's fever started to subside. Episodes of delirium had occurred quite often, and she only wished for it to end. Luckily, it did. Lizzie opened her eyes, uncertain of which day it was, and glanced at the beams of sunlight that broke through the small gaps in the two curtains. Her head still ached, 
and she recalled numerous instances where Emma and William had visited her, as well as James. She had not recalled seeing Kitty, but if she had not visited, Lizzie would certainly not hold it against her. The Duchess was heavy with child, and she didn't wish to spread her illness to the Duchess and cause any harm to the unborn child. She also recalled Carson being there most times, and that he had held on to her hand, speaking in a low voice. His words had soothed her mind and soul, and in a manner it had helped her through the worst of her illness. Lizzie turned her head, and a smile formed on her lips as she noticed Carson sitting beside her bed, peacefully asleep in the chair, his hand still over hers. She moved her hand slowly away, and his gripped hers tightly. Carson, she whispered in a hoarse voice, her chest aching slightly from all the coughing. Her throat felt raw, so she swallowed hard and spoke once more. Carson? Carson's eyes opened, and as soon as their gazes met, he straightened up and leaned closer to her. Good morning, she whispered, but her brow furrowed immediately after. It is morning, is it not? It is, Carson answered with a smile. How are you feeling? As though I have slept for a lifetime, Lizzie answered. Has anything exciting happened? Carson chuckled and kissed the top of her hand. Nothing at all. A short silence filled the bedchamber, and Carson's expression turned rather grim. What is the matter? Lizzie asked. I am truly sorry that I didn't listen to you, my lady. What do you speak of? Lizzie asked, and shifted closer toward Carson. You told me that it was time to go before your brothers became worried, but I wanted you to stay with me longer. Because of that, I caused your illness. Carson explained. Don't be absurd. It was not your fault. Rain is not ideal for me to frolic around in even at the best of times. I have a weakness in my chest, caused by illnesses as a child. But I should have been aware of that. Carson sighed. Look at me, Lizzie said, with a hint of firmness in her tone, and Carson complied. It is not your fault. And please do not blame yourself for this. You have done so much for me, and I do not possess the words to express how grateful I am for you. The corners of Carson's lips finally lifted. I love you very much, Lizzie. And I love you, Carson. You are the only person whom I wish to have by my bedside, watching over me, Lizzie said, with the utmost sincerity. I would prefer to not see you in such an ill manner, Carson said with a smile. But there is no other place I would rather be. Lizzie squeezed his hand. There is something I wish to show you if you would accompany me. Accompany you? To where? To the garden. There is something I wish to show you, Lizzie muttered and sat upright. No, I cannot allow you to do that. You must rest. Have I not rested enough? Lizzie protested. I have been in this bed for... Over a fortnight, Carson completed her sentence. Over a fortnight? Good gracious! It is most certainly time for me to breathe some fresh air, Lizzie exclaimed. My lady, you cannot. Lizzie threw the blanket off herself and glanced at Carson. I feel fine, truly. But if it will make you feel any better, I shall wear a coat and a hood. If your brothers were to find out that I allowed this to happen, I will place all the responsibility upon myself. They are aware of how stubborn I am, and they will not give it a moment's thought that you had anything to do with it, Lizzie said. Carson exhaled slowly and nodded. Very well. Within a few minutes, Lizzie was wrapped in a thick coat and made her way through the halls beside Carson, who seemed to watch her every move, her every breath, to ensure that she was not putting her health in jeopardy. Please stop fretting so much, Carson. I told you, I am fine, Lizzie whispered, 
as she lightly squeezed his hand. They made their way down the stairwell and reached the terrace. There was not a soul in sight which pleased Lizzie, as she knew that if either of her brothers knew what she had planned, they would certainly send her back to bed. Lizzie, I truly do not understand why you wish to go to the garden at this particular moment, Carson pointed out. You will understand soon, Lizzie assured him, and pointed to the spade resting against the wall. Bring the spade along. The spade? Carson inquired with a frown. She simply kept walking, and Carson grabbed the implement, following closely behind her. Lizzie walked slowly to ensure that she didn't tire herself out. She came to a stop a short distance from the hole in the wall and glanced at Carson. Before I speak, need I remind you that I love you no matter what, and that you have made my life perfect from the moment I met you. Carson's brow furrowed once more, and he glanced at her quizzically. Your words are both comforting and unsettling at the same time. Lizzie chuckled and shook her head, the hood of her cape shifting off her head. I buried something here, and I would like you to retrieve it for me. It is not something that had been alive at one point, is it? Carson cringed. Lizzie chuckled once more, but her laughter soon caused her to cough, and Carson shook his head. I insist that we go back inside, he stated. Please allow me to do this. I beg you. Then I promise we can go back. Very well. Where would you wish for me to dig? Carson asked. Exactly there. Lizzie pointed to a very specific area on the ground. Carson hunched down and dug in the ground with the spade. As soon as he struck something hard in the ground, he dropped the spade beside him and dug with his hands. Lizzie knelt beside him and watched as he retrieved one of her favourite wooden boxes, flowers intricately engraved on the sides, from the loose soil. He handed it to her, and she smiled at him. Why is this wooden box so important, my lady? Carson asked. Please do not be angry with me, but do you recall the day I assisted you with sorting through your father's things in the study? I do. I came across a few letters your mother wrote to your father, telling him how much she still loved him and how she misses you all. She also asked your father if he would consider joining her in Aberystwyth. She said they belonged together, and she didn't wish to be apart from you all any longer. Carson gaped at her. You took my father's letters. Lizzie swallowed the awkward lump in her throat, but pushed forward nonetheless. I did, and I am truly sorry. I was trying to protect you. You must believe me. I wanted to show you for a while now, but with everything that happened the past few months, I thought it would be too much for you to handle. It was never my intention to keep it from you, Carson, but you were mourning the death of your father, and you didn't need this on your plate as well. Normally I would be upset if people spoke those words to me if they assumed they had known what was in my best interest, Carson stated. Lizzie drew in a shallow and anxious breath. She didn't wish for Carson to be in any way upset or feel resentful toward her over the fact that she had taken his mother's letters to his father. She nervously bit her bottom lip and waited for Carson to continue. But, my lady, you have known me for such a long time, and you know exactly who I am and what I need. You are not upset with me? Lizzie asked. How can I be upset with the one person who means the world to me, and who would do anything in her power to protect me? Carson asked with a tender smile. Relief flowed over Lizzie like a cleansing rain. I love you very much, Carson. And I love you, Lizzie, Carson whispered sincerely. There is something I must share with you as well. You must be wondering what my mother is doing in Aberystwyth. Lizzie inhaled sharply and told the truth. No, I already know. You know? Everything, Carson asked, his eyebrows flying up on his forehead. She nodded. 
I do, and I have known for a while. And you didn't say anything? Lizzie shrugged. It didn't matter to me. I fell in love with your heart, your mind, and the person you are, not because you are the son of a princess. I love you because of who you are in here, Lizzie declared, and placed her hand against his heart. I have fallen in love with you so deeply, so intensely, and so perfectly. I simply wished we had realized this sooner. I must admit that I have loved you since the very first time I saw you. Lizzie couldn't help but smile at that. You were five years old, Carson. Carson grinned. The heart wants what it wants, whether you are five or fifty. You are such a silly man, and I love that about you, Lizzie smiled. Why did you wait so long to tell me of your feelings? I was terrified you would reject me. Lizzie couldn't believe it. Why would I reject you? I thought you deserved better than me, Carson admitted. The only problem was that the love I had for you burned through even the rainiest night, even though I tried to extinguish it many times. I simply thought that you would never love a simple man such as I. Simple? She'd never thought of him that way. There is no one better for me than you, Carson. That I know now. And I will keep on reminding you of that until our last breaths, Lizzie whispered and pressed her palm against Carson's cheek. Carson leaned forward and kissed her sweetly on the lips. Did you mean what you said to me? About wishing to marry me as long as I promised to get better, Lizzie whispered against his lips. I did. I love you, and I wish to spend the rest of my life beside you. I would marry you in a heartbeat, Carson answered, and brushed a strand of hair from her face. Perhaps we should stick to our originally discussed plan. Springtime it is. Carson smiled and kissed her sweet lips once more. Her heart beat steadily in her chest, easing away the painful stabbing aches inside her. Carson! Lizzie! Their kiss was interrupted by desperate exclamations sounding from the manor. Did I not say your brother is going to be rather dissatisfied that I allowed you outside in your state? I am not in a state. Lizzie rolled her eyes. And if you listened closely, that is not my brother's angry exclamation. Something has him in a panic. What could it be? Lizzie and Carson turned as they heard the terrace doors fly open and Will stepped into the sunlight. Carson! Lizzie! There you are! What is the matter, William? Come quickly, Will called out to them. The Duchess has gone into labour. Lizzie and Carson glanced at one another, and excitement filled both their faces. Come along, my dear. Carson reached out his hand to Lizzie, and she placed her hand in his without a moment's hesitation. Thank you for listening to Marrying Her Best Friend, Book Three of The Seymour Siblings, by Fiona Myers. Narrated by Catherine Bilson. Copyright 2020. Audiobook Production Copyright 2022.